Moment. Peace to the gods. No, we got the call in number up. The number you're dialing is outside of your plane. It means for a one point per minute charge. To pick it up, you can hang up now to avoid the charge. Okay. Had to get this thing connected. How's everybody doing today? Peace, peace, peace. Give me a, give me a sound check, sound check, mic check. Mic check, mic check. God, I got to put these on. Mic check. All right, let's see. Everything sounds good. All right. Okay, cool. How's everybody doing today? <clears throat> Thought I would get in and connect with all of you on this beautiful Memorial Day. How's everybody's Memorial Day going? Hopefully you've been um, spending time with family and friends and enjoying yourselves. I myself, you know, I've been I've been busy. I, I've moved into a new place. I got a new studio. I got stuff, you know, I, and that's why you haven't seen a lot of me. Um, you know, I've been trying to organize. You know, moving is a mug. Woof. I hate moving. I hate moving. Anyway, but in the interim, I have been uploading some old shows, you know, um, I'm going to continue to upload a lot of old shows, you know, I think uh, my old shows will give individuals a little bit of perspective uh, on me. Um, and, you know, cause I went like seven years just basically doing what I'm about to do now. And that is just take phone calls and answer questions. Um, I don't know if you've just tuned in. There is going to be a call-in number today. There's a call-in number. That number is 563-999-3616. Um, if you don't see it on your screen, simply refresh your screen and you will see the number on your screen. So you can call in and talk to the host, which is me, and ask some questions. But today, before we get into that, I am going to be discussing um, status correction and what is the status correction. Um, and right before that, I got a quick announcement to make. Yes, um, I am having a seminar that's going to be in Dallas, Texas, my home state, Dallas, Texas, 
All right, I can't, you know, this is, this is, go, I'm going to put everything into this seminar. So if you've ever, if you've never come to see me before, this is the time to come see me in my home city in Dallas, Texas. It's going to be at the Crown Plaza Hotel. Um, it's going to be on the 1st and 2nd of July. Our registration link is in the description. Now, let me tell you about the registration because you may get thrown off a little bit. Um, I'm using Currency Circulator to regi register. It's easy for me to keep um, um, in touch with everybody who registers, as well as the fact um, you can communicate with me easier. I'm going to make Currency Circulator is going to be my little registration platform. And also, in, a, in, in addition to the fact that I'm now putting in full gear this investment trust, and I'm going to be using Currency Circ uh, Circulator to facilitate that. So everybody who registers, you're going to be automatically be registered in Currency Circulator. That's what I'm doing. You automatically register in Currency Circulator. All right. So let that, just know that. Understand that. And that's going to be a, something good all right, that we're putting together for you. All right. Cool, cool, cool. So status correction. Um, I want to talk about status correction and give you some background. And I don't know, some of you out there watching me, you may be new to the platform. You may be new to this information. So I'm going to give you a little background information as it relates to this term that you see being thrown around called status correction. Now, I have never really been, a, been fond of the word status correction because my understanding of the information is that we have a public and a private, and in the public, everything is a legal fiction entity or an artificial person, and in the private, are real living souls. So what exactly are we correcting? You know, it's like, I've already, I've always been a real living soul. I've never been, if there has been any type of misconception as far as me and the straw man being one and the same, it's really not any fault on the government side. It's on my side, you know, my confusion and how am the way that I think. But I get what people are saying. You know, we want to put the government on notice. I, it's, and this is all notices. Notices fall under the Uniform Commercial Code in every state, and that's in UCC 1-202. Now, the status correction is dealing in a system that is commercial in nature. It's commercial in nature. Now, some people will take issue uh, with that. I've had, and I don't really care because I've done extensive research on this. I read case law. I've, um, I've helped people in prison. I've read indictments. I've read everything. Everything that I have personally studied has pointed in the direction that it is all commercial in nature. You look at anybody's indictment on the federal level, it's going to say they violated interstate commerce. The interstate commerce clause is Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. OK, and their court system is Article one, Section eight, Clause nine. I watch um, judicial committee um, uh, 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 meetings on YouTube. Many people don't even do it. You know, I sit there and the Congress is always giving you notice. People are always saying, oh, well, they're doing fraud against us. You're not sitting there watching when they're deliberating and Senate hearings and things like that. You're not even you're not paying any attention to anything. You know, you're not involved in your government. You're not paying attention to nothing. You're just making a statement. They tell you things all the time. I'm surprised at how much that they reveal. They're not hiding too much. It's just that the American people are operating in ignorance and apathetic. You're apathetic. You're too focused on things that of no matter, of no concern, you know, not really, really that important. I mean, well, you know, your livelihood is important, but, you know, other things like, you know, racism. <laughs> Look, you know, don't, you know, don't, don't fall for that. The next election, don't let them come at you, start talking about racism and we need to address racism and all that. Don't fall for any of that. The status correction is in a sense, reverting the country back to its original form, uh, its original form. And also putting your public servants back in the position that this country meant for them to be in, and that is of a public servant. You gotta understand that people in your government, we have a representative form of government, which means that we take from the pool of people and we pick someone amongst us to go up there and represent our interests on Capitol Hill. They're not up there supposed to be making deals with foreign powers and enriching themselves or anything like that. They are supposed to be up there representing the interests of the constituency that place them up there, okay? And that interest that they're supposed to be protecting, they're supposed to be protecting our borders, okay? All right? And our individual liberties, and they're not supposed to be getting involved in our private affairs, 
Okay, that is what freedom is in this country. Freedom in this country is represented through private property ownership, the ability to have private property. Now, you have someone called Karl um, Karl Marx. He wrote a document called the Communist Manifesto. And it's a real interesting. It's really, really interesting what this man, (laughs) what this man said, you know, in this Communist Manifesto. And I'm going to read it for you. Let me see if I can if I can uh, read this for you. If I can read this for you real quick. Oh my God, don't get this. Okay, here it is. All right. I got so much security on this website now. Um, Let me see if I can get it on the screen for all of you. And I want to read this to you. This, This is very, very, very important for you to understand. Okay, so right now we're on SBC University, and I'm going to go into the classroom section. Let's go to the classroom real quick. We're going to go to the download section. And right here in the class documents, you see Communist Manifesto. Now, I want people to pay attention to this. This is Karl Marx and Frederick Engels. Um, they, somebody just put out a video showing everyone that almost all of your major positions in your government now are occupied by Jewish individuals. Almost all, you know, all of them, all the positions of power, treasury, secretary, just everybody, you know, you know, the head of the Democratic Party, you know, the eight head of the ATF, you know, your, your, your attorney general, everybody's Jewish. And the communism is something that was created. It's a Jewish creation, as well as this new world order that all of you keep hearing about. The um, architects of that are is the, is Zionist Jews. Let me put it like this: Zionist Jews. So that's something that you need to be mindful of. You know, you need to be mindful of this. So when I'm reading this, Karl Marx was Jewish. Albert Einstein was Jewish. Charles Darwin was Jewish. You know, the person that was telling you you came from animals. You know, and things like that. You need you need to start really paying attention to these things because it's going to be shocking to you once you see that the truth has been staring you in front of your face all the time. This is why we're doing and and what's going to protect you from what is coming ahead is you understanding and have a proper understanding of private property rights. This is what's going to this is what's going to help you, all right, to to ward off and defend against the uh, what's coming. Okay, what's coming is the elimination. What they're attempting to do is eliminate all private property rights. You can't have no gun. You can't. You won't own anything, and you'll be happy. You know the, the individual who said that Jewish. You know Dershowitz. You know talking about well, we can force you to take vaccines. Jewish. You know I can just keep going on and on and on down the list. But I'm going to. You know it's going to sound like I'm. You know of course. You know I'm. Oh, you're being biased and you know whatever. All right. But let's get in here. This is the first thing I want you to read because I want you to understand, once again, I want you to understand this. I want you to understand this. All right, so you can see. All right, so right here on page 42, and, and I, I'm going to give you a quick, uh, communism is based, based off victimization also. Okay, victimization. That's why you see them pay the victim card all the time in the Democratic Party. And 70, you know, 70% of all Jews are Democrats, by the way. But the Democratic Party, okay, always plays up on this victim card, which is, which is an atheistic concept because... Um, it, it, it implies that there is no God or, you know, there's, you know, or that or, or and it also denies any type of uh, accountability on the person himself for, for his condition. OK, so I want you to I want you to be aware of that. All right. So let's read this, what this man is saying. 
because now the bourgeoisie is the wealthy people, and of course the pro- proletariat or the working class or you know, the poor people. So he said the distinguishing feature of communism is not the abolition of property generally, but the abolition of bourgeois property. But modern bourgeois private property is the final and most complete expression of the system of producing and appropriating products that is based on class antagonisms on the exploitation of the many by the few. In this sense, the theory of the communist may be summed up in a single sentence, the abolition of private property. All right, so there you go. Um, you know, it, this is also implies that uh, capitalism is the source of all the agonies for the um, poor people and that capitalism allows the wealthy individuals to exploit the po- uh, the poor people. Okay, now, I have never believed in that. I think that capitalism is something that God favors, and I'm going to tell you why, all right? All right. The way that the laws of the universe are set up The one main law is the law of attraction, okay? You attract what you are. A lot of people, they don't like to hear that because they like to lay blame. The first thing somebody will come out of their mouth is, what about rape? What about, you know, a baby? And, you know, they'll bring up all of these different scenarios in their ignorance because they don't understand how universal laws or spiritual laws operate, but just off their perception of things and because they um, have a victim mentality. You know, they just like, they, they want to point at the evils of other people. And this is what you see um, them doing in government all the time. We're talking about racism. We, we need to do something about racism. We need to do something about racism. We need to do something about gun violence. We need to do something, just all of these different things, which are nothing but ploys to get you to voluntarily give up your rights. Because in the United States of America, the federal government, they can't do anything without the consent of the people. So they need you to consent to that. They can't take your gun rights. You have to give willingly give them away. And that's through the voting process, which is why they like democracy so much, because democracy is mob rule, it's majority rule. So it doesn't respect the rights of the individual. It goes whatever the 51%, the 49% have to go with it. And when they do that, like you just saw with the uh, last election, they can control the outcome. You know, it's a it's a, it's an easy scheme to dissect of why they choose to go with democracy and all these different things because these are the vehicles that will allow them to take over the world. I I heard a um uh, who was that who um I forgot what the guy just saw his meme where he said you know that the lifeblood of communism is democracy. And I'm seeing, and when you go and study history, you will see all of this. You know, democracy, um, basically, you know, uh, you know, they've led people to believe that democracy is synonymous with freedom. You know, our democracy, our democracy. And, you know, you hear, you hear that word so much that it's been programmed into your mind that you associated with freedom. But the word is not in the Constitution for the United States of America anywhere. So why would our government officials be using that term? Why wouldn't they be using terms that are in the Constitution for the United States of America? Because that is the document that gave them their delegation of authority to operate from. Now, you have some. Now, one thing I have noticed is that I do see some um, um, government officials who attempt to, you know, uh, put this out into the public. But what's really interesting is, you know, I, I don't know if I can trust any of them because all of them have to, you know, bow down. You know, they all have to sign this thing saying that they will support Israel. That's one thing you'll see when it comes to Israel. They just all, whatever differences they have, no matter how, you know, passionate they speak on the House floor or anything like that, when it comes to that, they all get silent. And they make a lot of threats at each other, but nothing ever gets done. Nobody gets impeached. Nobody gets indicted. Nothing ever happens to anyone. They'll bring out some controversy to make it seem as if they're at odds with people who are doing evil in the government or anything, but you never see anything happen to anybody or you never see anything change. What you see is the progressive march toward a new world order. And all the time, it, they seem to be operating in a position where they say, well, you know, I'm, you know, of, uh, you know, they, well, they can say, hey, look, don't look at me. I was the one who was telling you all the time. You know, that's what I see. That's what I see. I don't see anything, you know, really being done. So at the end of the day, what's going to happen is that you're going to need to take care of yourself. 
It's the American people that have to police the people in government. But you got to pay attention. They give you these games. We got the the NBA finals going on right now and all these things. And, they, and, and you know, they got this. They'll, they'll put up something. This is how funny it is. They'll put up uh, something on TV showing that we're about to go to war and they'll switch to a, next to a commercial. Let's get back to the game now. <laughs> this is what American people at. We don't take anything serious over here. We're too comfortable. And anytime you get comfortable, you, that's dangerous for you to get comfortable. So you need to start paying more attention to your government. They're going to always uh, operate under plausible deniability. Plausible deniability. Now, nobody wants to take um, uh, uh, accountability for anything. Nobody wants liability for anything in government. They, are, they, always, they all want to operate under complete elimination of liability. So not limited liability. They don't want any liability whatsoever. So they tell you things that they're going to do. They put it in your face. They bring out these, um, uh, 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 like, for instance, with Joe Biden and, and Hunter Biden with the laptop. You know, it's like, you know, it's like nothing's happening to them. Nothing's going to happen to them. Why would it not happen to them? How can the American people can, can't go up there and say, look, man, y'all better do something. You know what's going to happen? We're going to charge you with treason. And you know what happens if you get charged with treason? Them people are up there acting like they are kings and you're treating them like kings. You're acting like they're kings. And we don't have any kings or queens in the United States of America. We don't have no rulers in the United States of America. These are not rulers. These are representatives. They represent us. OK, they're like agents. We're telling them, look, we want you to do X, Y and Z. And that's what they're supposed to go up there and do. Nothing else. So with that being said, back to the subject of hand, status correction. The reason that they are treating you in such a way so poorly and they don't look at you at, up on you as anyone that they have to answer to because you're being viewed as someone who is incompetent and incapable of taking care of yourself. When you constantly take benefits and privileges from the government, the government has to borrow they're supposed to be coining money. That's what the Constitution tells them to do. But for some odd reason, they are borrowing money from the Federal Reserve. And now we have a Federal Reserve board in this country composed of all Jews, composed of all Jews. And their agent, Janet Yellen, who's at the Secretary of Treasury, she's Jewish as well. All right. We have to go to them and borrow money from them. All right. And that is based off the fact that, well, how do we, they guarantee and repayment of this money that they're borrowing? Obviously, they have to take a birth certificate up there and show them all the children that are being born. If they sit there telling you that this debt is something that's going to be put on the backs of your children, well, how do we guarantee? How, how would, would you loan money to someone if they say, well, my children are going to pay this back? I'm like, well, how do I know you're going to have any children? children. They're going to have to, well, hey, man, here, here's all the people, here's all the birth certificates of everybody who was just born. Obviously, they have to have something like that to show them in order to borrow money. But what, where is this money going? How is it that your government is giving money to the Ukraine and different, and you go and study that's Jewish, it's Jewish. I, I knew it. I knew that's what it was when I studied it. They're taking money from you I borrowing money and giving it to their masters and helping their masters and so forth. That's what they're doing. They swore an allegiance to these people. These people have committed treason. In my opinion, everybody on Capitol Hill needs to be removed. And you need a whole new group of people and you need to put something in place where they have to swear an oath not to they need not to take any money that your that your salary is going to be just your salary. If you make two hundred fifty thousand dollars a year, that's it. You can't invest in nothing. Once you choose to go in public service, you can't invest in nothing. You can't do anything. You got to do straight public service. You got to do straight public service. If you get caught um, assigning anything, allegiance to another country, you get, you get shot dead. You get put in front of a firing squad like it's supposed to be. Like it's supposed to be. This is what is supposed to be going on. But, you know, it's like that's not what's happening right now because the American people are too lackadaisical and they're being viewed as dependents. Dependence. And we all know about dependence. Anybody who's dependent on by nobody, they don't make the rules. You know, like when your children, as long as they're dependent on you, do they make rules in your house? No. So you got to get out of their house. And what indicates or what evidence is that we're in their house is when we utilize a social security number. The social security number. 
Okay, that social security number is a welfare number that was created in 1933 under the Franklin Delano Roosevelt administration under the New Deal program. And you hear this word New Deal and nobody ever asks, well, what do you mean New Deal? What was the old deal? The New Deal is that we will take care of you as long as you agree to be a surety for the national debt. We're bankrupt, so we got to borrow money and you need to co-sign for us. You need to agree to pay back this debt. If you do this, we'll take care of everything for you. And we know in the Bible where it says the debtor is enslaved to the creditor. All right? Also in Leviticus 25, 45, let's look at this real quick. This is all biblical. You need to pay attention to this. Let's look at something else real quick. All right. So right here we got, I'm on a biblehub.com or something like that. I, I, I forgot exactly. But right here, you can see right here, if we go down to 2545. Let's start up here at around 44. It says, both thy bond men, and we know this bond means somebody owes somebody some money. Both thy bond men and bond maids, which thou shall have, shall be of the heathen that are round about you, of them shall you uh, buy bond men and bond maids. I want the camera on me while I talk about this real quick. That word heathen, let me tell you something. I was in a courtroom proceeding. I was in a courtroom proceeding and uh, in a federal court, in U.S. District Court, in front of Judge Julie Carnes. Y'all can look her up. Julie Carnes, she's in the, I think she's in the appellate court now. She's no longer in the U.S. District Court, but her name is Julie Carnes, and I was in front of her, and I, um, I think she's Jewish too. <laughs> I had to look that up. I never looked that up, but you know, most of them are, and um, I, w- I, re- I, did, I did an affidavit of, uh, of truth. I only went into the courtroom with a couple of pieces of paper, uh, and what I went into the courtroom with um, they had sent all my discovery to my sale, and it was two boxes full of discovery. Uh, when they let me out of my sale, I took the two boxes of discovery and threw it in the trash. And the only thing is I didn't want anything, because uh, um, I knew none of that mattered. I knew none of that mattered. And for me to sit in my sale and look at the evidence that they had against me, it was programming my mind to be fearful. And I know that's what they wanted. They wanted me to be fearful of what was going to happen to me. So when I opened, so they sent all that stuff, you know, the, uh, the prosecutor sent all that stuff to me because I was representing myself. She said, well, this is all the evidence we got against you. And she also wanted me to know, yeah, I know where you're getting this information you're trying to come in court with. And when they let me out of my sale, there was a trash can right outside the door of my sale. I took two boxes of discovery and threw that shit in the trash. And the only thing that I came into the courtroom with was um, some Miller Act bonds, 271, 272, and 270, when it was 273, 274, and 275 Miller Act bonds. Um, I came in with a bill of exchange and a, uh, uh, an affidavit of truth. That was it. I didn't have, I didn't have, I had probably about four or five pieces of paper. And when I came into the courtroom, um, I was representing myself, so I had fired my attorney because she refused to do what I asked her to do. So I stood up in court and fired her. I said, Yana, counsel is refusing to follow my instructions. Therefore, counsel is no longer necessary. And then I read into the record um, the letter of rogatory for the instructions for her. And then when I went to the next proceeding, I instructed her to take the GSA bonds and take them up there and file them because, you know, there's a court clerk in the courtroom. So they brought me in in handcuffs. I was sitting down. She was sitting next to me. Um, There wasn't a lot of there wasn't anybody in there other than U.S. Marshals. They had about 10 U.S. Marshals in there all around the courtroom, all stationed in every corner of the courtroom, all the way around. They were all sitting down. uh, and they had the prosecutor and two assistant prosecutors and the attorney that was with me, and that was it. That was it. That was, uh, and I had another assistant. I saw she had her assistant with her. Those are the only people that were in the courtroom, and the judge and the clerk. Those are the only people in the courtroom. So when I went in, to, when I sat down and she first spoke to me, I asked, I, I told the, uh, the attorney, I whispered to her, I said, hey, take these up there and I want you to file them with the clerk. 
because I've been working on all of this stuff in my cell. And I came into the courtroom. I said, okay, take all this stuff to the clerk. She stood up and she said to the uh, judge, Yana has some paperwork on the file. She fired back, said, sit down. You in my courtroom. Then she started directing to me and she said, look, let me tell you something, Mr. Jones. This is my courtroom. You're not going to be doing any uh, talking and you're going to only speak when you're being spoken to. Do you understand me? And I looked at her very calmly and I said, am I to understand the honorable judge has made a judicial determination that I'm not to be afforded my due process rights or freedom of speech in these proceedings? For the record, ma'am. I said it very calm, calmly. It killed all of that aggressiveness out of her. That went away after that. She said, you'll get your chance to speak. Don't let them see that they can rattle you. Don't allow them to rattle you because they, they, are, very, they are trained in psychology. So you need to understand that. So you got to always stay in your position, always stay in your square, always stay in your frame. Don't let any judge, all are equal under the law. The judge is an unbiased arbiter in a dispute between two opposing parties. She's not supposed to show preferential treatment to either side. And she is beholden to the Constitution for the United States of America like everybody else in public service. All right, so after that, she stood up, she took the paperwork up there. Okay, when she attempted to file the paperwork, the judge said, let me see that paperwork before you file it. She gave it to the judge. The judge looked at me and said, I'm not filing this. This has nothing to do with this case, and I'm not filing it. And I said, I fired back again. I said, am I to understand the honorable judge has made a judicial determination and I'm not to be afforded my due process rights of access to the public record? And she said, I ain't filing it. I didn't know what to say after that. And so I looked around and I said, okay, well, let me get it back. She said, no. And I was confused, I said, what? She said, you don't need to have this. She would start looking at this paperwork and everything. Now before that, let me say, I kind of jumped the gun on what happened because it was, uh, it, uh, it was significant of me telling you that there were US marshals in the courtroom because when it was my turn to speak, she asked me to stand up to speak before every time I speak. You know, you can't sit down and speak, you know, stand up and then speak. So when I stood to speak, I stood up to speak. As I stood up, 10 U.S. Marshals all stood up with me. And you just heard all this rattling of chairs and everything. And it, it alarmed me and threw me off because I thought they were going to attack me or thought I was going to attack the judge or something because I, I just stood up. To, she told me to stand up to speak. So when I stood up to speak, they did all of this stuff. And, I, and it threw me off for a quick second because I was like, oh, my. I was like, what's going on? You know, and I looked at her and it's what you do. You pay attention to the judge because she got a smirk on her face. They're doing things to try to shake you. You got to understand is that there's one thing they can't do. They cannot take away your free will. And anything you say can and will be used against you. So you got to be careful of the words you use and you got to be careful of what you say on the public record and of exposing the truth on the public record. You have to word things in such a way where you don't put them on blast too much, especially if you've never dealt with the federal government. The federal government is nothing like the state government. If you're out there and you got arrested by the state and you've never been arrested by the feds, let me tell you something. It's a difference. Let me tell you the difference in the state and the feds. Getting arrested by the state is like getting got, uh, uh, like elementary school. Getting rid of, arrested by the feds is like dealing with motherfuckers in PhD or something like that. You know, it's a totally different level of incarceration because you can be incarcerated anywhere in the country. They could take you anywhere in the United States and hide you. If they don't like what you're doing, they'll take you up to Alaska. It's okay, your, court, your trial date is in Georgia in two months, but we're going to hold you in Alaska in solitary confinement till, till, you, till you have trial. They can do shit like that in the feds, okay? Anybody know what I'm talking about, diesel therapy? You know, have diesel therapy, all right? Some of y'all may be, some of y'all may be hip to that. How many people in the, in the chat room know, know what I mean when I say diesel therapy? How many of y'all know what that means when I say diesel therapy? Just interesting. But anyway, so, so all I did was, and, and let me tell you what I said to her. After all of the going back and forth and all of this, um, all I did was I read a affidavit of truth in the record. And that lady didn't listen to anything I said until I got to I told her I wasn't a heathen. Let me tell y'all something. Pay attention. What do you think is going on in society? 
What do you think that they're doing? They are turning you into heathens. Heathens. Okay. They can make slaves from heathens, bondmaids and bond servants from heathens. Okay, now what is a heathen? This is very important. Um, you're not going to get this anywhere else. You know why you're not going to get this anywhere else? Because morality is not anything anyone wants to address in today's time, as well as God or anything like that. It's becoming a godless society. Everything in the West is godless now. You look down upon if you say you're a Christian, Muslim, or, or anything like that. You ascribe to any type of religion or anything like that. You looked at, oh, that's old. That's what it is. But I'm telling you, that's a, that is intentionally being done. You need, you need to go back and look at the stories of Lucifer or Iblis and Allah or Lucifer and God, the bets that they were making, like in Job, the bet God made, uh, the devil made with uh, God about Job or Iblis when he got into a discussion with Allah, what he said, you know, these men are weak and willed. He said, you know, they don't deserve it. I'm not bowing down to him. I'm going to show you. I'm going to show you they're not worthy. This is what it is. It, it is. All of this thing is a platform to, to demonstrate that you are not worthy and that you are some sort of heathen, that you're not worthy. Everything from, why do you think they're calling you an animal? They say, oh, yeah, y'all, they came from animals. They're not real men. We can do whatever we want to do, do to them anyway because they dehumanize you and they say, okay, well, you're not, y'all not really human beings anyway. Now they got, I can show you videos on the YouTube where on YouTube where they're saying this. They're saying that hey, they, these goyim are not human beings. They are not true human beings. They're animals. Now the word animal comes from the word animate. It means a living creature. That's what the word animal means. It means living creature. You get you an Oxford Unabridged Dictionary and look up that word. But if all you do is sleep eat and reproduce, then what distinguishes you from the lions? The hey, I look at lions and lions got better society than we got. Lions are amazing to me. I've been studying lions for like the last two months. They have a hierarchy. They have a family. They care for their young. The women know their role. The men know their role. I mean, it's just, I almost like human beings. You start looking at lions long enough. You're like, like, damn, these, these, these creatures are elevate, I think in a million years, they're going to be walking around like human beings doing the same thing we're doing. Because you can see it, you know, in a primitive state, but they're, you know, it's like, but anyway, so this word heathen, let's look at this word heathen, because this is what you are correcting. This is the true status correction. This is the true status correction that you are correcting about yourself. You are correcting So right here, we can look in the dictionary. We can see the word heathen, a person who does not belong to widely held religion, especially one who is not a Christian, Jew, or Muslim, as regarded by those who do. Let me see if I got another one. Miriam Dick. Let's look at Miriam. Heathen. Okay, old oh, fat. You don't pre you don't practice Christianity, Judaism, or Islam of relating of heathens, their religions or their customs. Pagan, strange. Un this is the old fashioned, disapproving, strange, uncivilized. Okay, a person who is not religious or whose religion is not Judaism, Islam, especially Christianity. Old fashioned, a non-religious or uncultured person. All right. Heathen is a dated term used primarily of someone who is not religious or whose religion is not Judaism, Islam, or especially Christianity. It is also sometimes used disapprovingly of someone who is not cultured. This use is also dated. In current use, pagan is most commonly used of someone who practices a contemporary form of paganism, such as Wicca, making the word synonymous with neo-pagan. But pagan also has meanings identical, identical to those heathen. And, and let me just say this too real quick about this witchcraft, because you're going to notice also that if you haven't been noticing that they've been promoting witchcraft very heavily as well, and your movies and all your TV shows and things like that. And in your Bible, it says, thou shalt not suffer a witch to live. 
you know, these are all heathen, heathen practices. Now, I'm not opposed to the Wiccan religion in any kind of way because I have an elevated understanding of spirituality and the laws of the universe and I understand natural laws and that uh, usually those individuals who are involved sometimes in those practices, whether it be white or dark magic or something like that, they are simply adherents and students of natural law in a, in a different form than Christianity, Judaism, Islam. You know, you have Christian scientists, you have the Kabbalah and Judaism, you have the... Um, um, what is that? The uh, with the Muslims, you have the uh, whirling dervishes. With the, um, um, I'll think of it in, in a minute. But each branch of religion has a mystical sect, is what I'm trying to say. All right, and that mystical sect they go, is is everything. Everybody is studying the higher laws. All right, but a heathen. When you look at a heathen, it mostly is, and what I'm seeing are people who don't have any morality whatsoever, you know, and that is evidence. Uh, the first place we have to look to that is the male and female relations of that nation. Uh, in the Bible, it says, you know, you know, you cannot allow, you know, when they would kill like um, homosexuals, they'd stone them. Um, women who uh, that they were not uh, virgins at the time of marriage and things like that, you would see that they would associate that with a certain sort of spirit. And now I'm looking at that. And you have people who are saying they were born a certain way, and I see what they were saying. They say, he said, we cannot allow this spirit in our in our community. Spirit is associated with mind. Okay, those are two synonymous terms because the only activity a spirit can engage in is thinking. Okay, the spirit world is controlled by the mental. All right. So so when you start studying it on the level that I'm talking about right now and remind yourself that these guys are all Masons, Illuminati, uh, Rosicrucians, they all, every one of them are in some sort of secret society or something like that where they study the higher laws because I study their information as well. That's all they do is study these things I'm talking about, like the, the Kabbalah, uh, the Kabbalion and things like that. I'm teaching you all this because I'm trying to put you on par with them. That's why you see me make videos, natural law shows and things like that, because the information I'm giving you, I'm trying to put you on par with them so you can think like they think, because this is how they think. OK, so when you look at a person who is uncultured or who doesn't have any morality or doesn't have any type of culture, that means that you can't govern yourself. So if you can't govern yourself from the inside, you have to govern yourself from the outside. I think Theodore Roosevelt said that, didn't he? He said, I mean, let me just read that Theodore Roosevelt, who was a 33 degree Mason. I'm going to see if I can pull it up. I can't pull it up right here, but he said, you can look it up. Theodore Roosevelt said, you cannot go, you can't, the sovereign cannot make any excuses for his actions. And you have, if you cannot govern yourself from the inside, then you have to going to be governed from the outside. And that's why you always hear me say peace to the God, because a God is anything or anyone who's in control. I'm not calling you the creator of the boundless universe. If you are a Christian, Muslim, or Jew on this channel, and you hear me say peace to the God, and you don't understand what I'm saying, you are ignorant brute. You don't understand. You haven't studied any linguistics or anything like that. The word God is not even a word that exists in any original text on the planet. It came in in Germany around 750 A.D. It's Allah, Elo, Elohim. These are the words. Eli, like in Matthew 27, 46. Eli, Eli, Lema, Sebekteni. Elo and Elohim, Yahuwah, Elohim. The Tetragrammaton, Yahav, Wahav. We're talking about Hebrew, Aramaic, Greek. Where is the word God in any of those languages? When you come on this channel, you're dealing with an intellect. Keep your ignorant stupidity in your own circle. When I say God, I'm talking about, I'm referencing Genesis 3.22 when it says, look, the man has become as one of us. When I say God, I'm referencing Psalms 82.6 where he says, I have said you are gods and all of you are sons and daughters of the most high, but you shall die like men. The key phrase in there when he said you're sons and daughters, right, because that's Elohim is the word right there. But he calling you a son and daughter of the Most High, but you're going to die like men. He didn't say you were a man. He's going to die like a man. Some of you are men. Some of you are, are humans. Some of you are mortals. 
Some of you don't possess the DNA. Everybody here is not the same. If we were all the same, we'd all have the same blood type. There are people who have Rh negative blood. Rh negative blood is the same blood the Reese's monkey has. So don't sit here and think that everybody is the same. Everybody is not the same. Sorry to tell you that. Everybody's not the same. Or also in John 10, 34, where it says, is it not written in your law? I say you are gods. If you call them gods of who the word of God came, the scripture cannot be broken. If the scripture can't be broken, who the fuck do you think you are? That's why I'm so aggressive with it, because it exposes the fact that some of you are antichrist, because you get into a discussion with an individual and you start quoting Jesus and they want to start quoting Paul or some other stuff. It's the antichrist. He's anti. He's like, they want to hear what Jesus had to say. The antichrist. And this is what he's talking about in Matthew 24, 5. It says, it says, many shall come to you. Uh, uh, in my name saying I'm the Christ and deceive many and he said these people honor me with their lips but their hearts are far from me I mean when you get in there and read these scriptures you're like man how can somebody say that this is not real because this is what's going on today so we're talking about heathen so when you're talking about status correction when we're talking about status correction the first thing that we have to correct is your morality okay where is your morality where is your morality? Where is the covenant that you have with the creator of the boundless universe? How are you governing yourself? Not only in your societal norms, but also in your private affairs as well. How do you govern yourself with your significant other, your children, with your husband, with your sons and your daughters, with your parents? Honor your parents. My mother pisses me the fuck off a lot of times. But you know what I never do? I never dishonor her. I always know, if, even if she's in the wrong, I come back and apologize later and try to reestablish my relationship with her because that's my mother. So I always try to honor her, no matter how pissed off I get. My father as well. They both still alive. And I don't dishonor either one of them because they can piss me off all they want to, but they my mother and my father. And there is, there, there is a penalty when you dishonor your mother and your father. It don't matter what they did. They brought you into this world. Stay away from them. Don't talk to them. They piss you off like that, don't talk to them. I don't care what they did. Just don't talk to them. What is it, what is it? all you're going to do is hurt yourself. That's how you got to think. You're just going to hurt yourself. You have to root your mind in positivity in the first place. That's the law as well. You got to be positive. Thank you, Ivory Muhammad. Appreciate it. Thank you, Ivory Muhammad. So what is it? The status correction has to begin. And that's uh, and all the status corrections that I have witnessed through the years of me doing this begin with this basic principle that I'm telling you right now is that you have to ask yourself the question, OK, who are you? OK, and what contracts are you engaged in? What type of integrity did you have? What are the principles that you rest on? What square are you standing on? What are you standing on? It doesn't matter your religion to me. I'm going to be honest with you. It does not matter if you're a Christian. I've studied all the religions, Christian, Islam and Judaism. All right. They all have their flaws. They all have their good points. They all are basically trying, they all are interconnected and it's man that came in and separated them and gave them the labels that they've been given. But they all are talking about the same thing. Hell, uh, uh, the, the, the Quran talk about Jesus more than the Bible do. Isa ibn Miriam, they talk about him more than the Bible does. But a Christian won't read it just because of one thing. Y'all say that Jesus ain't the son of God. They say, well, no, he's a prophet. And then when I read in the scriptures, Jesus, you know, some of the Christians have elevated Jesus to the point where he is God. Now, I don't even understand that. How does the son of God become God? And he, in that discussion in John 10, 34, he explained it. He explained it to those rabbis. He said, look, man, I'm not saying I am. He said, he said, I am a God. He said, I'm not just a God, you are too. He said, he said, if you called them gods of who the word of God came to, the scripture cannot be broken. What is stated right there is they call them Elahams. 
Okay, so but people don't want to delve that deep into all of this. They would rather try to label you as some sort of detractor from the truth or something like that. When they fail to recognize, I'm sitting here on a mission. There are people here on a mission. We are warriors, and we couldn't have to cut up lies. And we don't give a damn how you feel about it. We don't give a damn about your feelings or nothing like that. We don't care how you don't like how we say it or nothing. We're just going to hear to tell the truth, though it be bitter. The status correction begins with your morality. You need to sit down and ask yourself the question, what do you believe in? And then after you tell me what you believe in, I'm going to ask you, what did you put your faith in? Because you know what's coming after that, because faith without works is dead. So if you claim you believe in something, is your conduct and your actions supporting the statement of what you believe in? When somebody tells you today, you know, I'm watching some of these young girls saying a mature person would say that your past doesn't matter. Let me tell you something, young lady. If you're a young lady out there and you are adhering to these other young ladies who are foolish, I don't know why any in the world anyone would be trying to take advice and wisdom from a 20 something year old young girl or something like that who hasn't that doesn't have a lot of life experience in any kind of way whatsoever who should still be on the pathway of seeking out wisdom, the Sarato Mustakin, or the straight and narrow path, all right? Your past matters. You can do things that have lifelong mistakes. You can make a mistake and catch AIDS, which is called a plague. If you don't govern yourself accordingly, you can make mistakes and end up in prison for the rest of your life. Your past matters. That's all that everything in the government is dealing with your past, especially if you go into the legal system, is dealing with your past while you have a criminal record. They judge you for the rest of your life. No matter how you correct yourself, you get a felony on your record, and you go and start a business and make a billion dollars, they will steal in their eyes, you are a convicted felon. Your past matters. So when we start correcting, the geek surgeon, thank you. I hope people study these universal laws no matter what is done. The law is always in effect. People, results will show, and that's true. That right there, thank you so much, the Greek surgeon. You have to understand that the law is not a respecter of persons. What that means is no, the law doesn't give a fuck what you think about the law. All right? I have to say it like that because I have to impress it upon your mind because you got people out there who talk as if I've actually heard people say that universal laws change always from the liberal side or some sort of atheist or some sort of Satanist or something like that. We'll try to say, well, you know, laws change. You know, this is, old, this is new times. You know, we don't have to do this. Women, you know, and a lot of women also saying it's like, well, you know, the things have changed now. You know, you know, men need to stay home and start taking care of the children and doing all this kind of stuff. This ridiculous nonsense. Your career doesn't mean anything. Doesn't mean anything. You die. Your career doesn't mean anything. You think you think the cre- you, you think you're going to be judged in this world off of your career? You go and stand in the pearly gates and say, you know, you know, um, God, I was, you know, I did, you know, have start my own business and you know, become quite successful in my business. <laughs> <coughs> and the creator is going to look at you and said, did you honor the covenant that you had with me? We have a contract. It's called a covenant. Did you honor the covenant that you had with me? Did you honor the covenant that you had with your husband or, or, or wife, if in the case of a man? Did you honor the covenant with me? That is what I am only concerned with. I'm enforcing a contract. I don't give a fuck about all this other shit you're talking about. I'm here to, I'm here to enforce a contract. I judge with equity. Contracts are judged with equity. Why do you think he's doing fairness, impartiality, and even-handed dealing? Fairness, impartiality, impartiality, and even-handed dealing. Fairness, impartiality, and even-handed dealing. 
equity. God judges with equity. Contracts are adjudicated in equity. We have a covenant. Did you honor your covenant? Do you even have a covenant? Do you even have one? People break their covenants all the time. They, don't, they think they, and let me just tell you this, in the case of individuals who arbitrarily and capriciously break, uh, break their covenant without a solid reason, like in the case of the divorces and things, there is a cause and effect associated with that. You don't get away with nothing. You don't get away with having an abortion. There is a karmic debt that is incurred when you prevent another soul from entering into this world and having an opportunity to have an experience. If you think you can do that and it's just all good, and who's promoting that? Once again, look who's promoting that. That's, that's heathen activity. That's heathen activity. How dare you try to make an assessment or you try to, you say, okay, well, that's not really a life yet. I can't even see how people can even come to those conclusions because you here. What if somebody prevented you? Don't you see the beauty of life? That I don't care if you couldn't raise the child or you couldn't afford it or you don't think you can offer it the best opportunity. The child chose you for some reason. You don't know what tomorrow will bring. God can t make you rich in an instant. You don't know what tomorrow's going to bring. Let me read this to you. Let me read this to you. Let's talk about worry. Let's talk about worry. Let's go to Matthew 6. Let's go to Matthew chapter 6. I think it's 622. And when I'm doing, when I'm going through all this, I'm giving y'all, I'm giving you principles. When they say, well, why is he reading from this Bible? I don't want you to think about this as, as religion. This is, okay, when you look at Jesus, I, how many of y'all grew up listening to Aesop's fables? And one thing, I thank you, my grandmother, she used to read to me Aesop's fables all the time. And Aesop's fables, there's always a moral to the story. That's where moral to the story came from, from Aesop's fables. And the moral to the story is, it came from Aesop's fables. And in Aesop's fables, you have dogs and cats and goats and lions and all kinds of animals talking. But there's a principle of life that is being conveyed, even though the characters in the story are fictional. So, I want you to look at the Bible the same way. Just because if you believe Jesus didn't exist or anything like that, that isn't beside the point. It's called an off point argument. And it's not the issue. It's not my concern. I'm looking at, I'm here to get wisdom. I'm here to get wisdom. That is where I, that, that's my objective to obtain wisdom. And if you've ever been initiated OK, it, it, for those of you who have ever read the Quran, Circle 7 or the Aquarian Gospels, one of the test of Jesus, he got wisdom from a five year old boy. Wisdom can come from anywhere. Once you become perceptive enough to be open to receive it. The, 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 the most high communicates to you from a variety of different sources. It might be a meme on, on Instagram. It might be uh, all something, something pop up on your new YouTube channel. You're being communicated to. But you have to be receptive. So right here, it's one of my favorite verses in the Bible. I like this, I'm going to start right here. I'm, I'm going to start at 20. Let's start at 19. Let's start at 19, the mystical number 19. Lay not up for yourselves treasures upon earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through and steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. The light of the body is the eye. Now you're going to see in some translation of the Bible, they're going to change it to eyes. These are demons. These are demons changing these translations. The light of the body is the eye. It's not talking about your physical eyes. It's talking about your third eye. 
The light of the body is the eye. If therefore thy eye be single, thy whole body shall be filled with light. But if thy eye be evil, thy whole body shall be full of darkness. If therefore the light that is thee be darkness, how great is that darkness? No man can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he will hold to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor yet for your body, what you shall put on is not the life more than meat and the body than raiment. Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father feedeth them. Are ye not much better than they? Which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature? And why take ye thought of raiment? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow. They toil not, neither do they spin. And yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. Wherefore, if God so clothed the grass of the field, which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven, shall he not much more clothe you, O ye of little faith? Therefore, take no thought, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or wherewithal shall we be clothed? For all these things do the Gentiles seek. Notice the Gentiles. All you out there who think you a Gentile, all you out there who are not under the laws, all you out there that need grace because you can't help yourself, you weak, and you need some grace. For all you out there, for all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knoweth that you have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. All right, now, the kingdom of God, now we see this. Also, in what? what? What verse do we see this? Luke 17. We go to Luke 17. Twenty-one. And right here he says it. He said, Neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. All right, now, you got to seek ye first the kingdom that you can look at, and that's what they want you to do. That's what they want you to do. They don't care what you believe in. They don't care what you do. All right, you can believe, you can, you can blame whoever you, you can have a victim mentality. You can blame Satan, the devil. All right, you can say it's because the, it was the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the Muslim's fault, or, you know, is that Pentecostal over there, that Catholic over there. They don't care what you believe in. There's only one thing that they don't want you to do. They don't ever want you to start looking inside. You can look wherever you want to look. And this man just told you this right here. Don't look there. Don't look here. The kingdom of God is in you. Why do you think I'm on my platform? The first, the first principle is mentalism. These are things I've been reading all of my life, and I govern my life by it. I still, let me put it like this. I still, with the level of success that I've had, I still um, have to make an effort every day to try to keep a positive outlook on life to not worry about things, to push worry to the side. Maybe I'm not making as much money as I was making. And he said, oh, you know, I'm not, you know, and he's like, nah, man, nah, nah. Why are you worried about that? Situation, I've been doing this for a long time. You can have a bad month and then your next month make up for the next three months. <laughs> it happens like that. It's a test. Everything is a test. Are you worthy? Look at this person. He had one bad month. He started cussing God. Oh, this don't work. God, why are you doing this to me? Speak truth always. Your status correction on your paperwork has to reflect. If you are saying that you're private, privacy doesn't mean that you have the right to do whatever you want to do because you cannot infringe upon the rights of others, including the rights of the public. The public has rights. It's called a public rights doctrine. The public has rights. There are private rights. Each individual, we have to respect their rights. This is how you have to govern yourself accordingly. You can't govern yourself or make good decisions until you've been given the truth. 
You can be trained wrong. Given wrong information, wrong information in is wrong information out. So it always starts with principles. Okay, the, one of the principles of life has just been given to you. Why are you worried about something? Worry is the biggest waste of energy that there is. 90% of the time, things you worry about never happen anyway. And all you're doing is attracting negativity to you. There is no value in worrying. So we understand that one of the first principles of life is to root yourself in positivity, to eliminate all negativity out of your life. That is one of the goals. If you're around individuals who are negative, you need to get away from them. What does it say in the Bible? Once again, I think Paul said this, bad association spoils useful habits. Take the five people that you hang around the most. If you how much ever they make, average that out, and that's how much money you make. It's the, it's the principle of vibration. Like attracts like. Whatever vibration, uh, bri- vibrational frequency you associate yourself with, that's what you're going to have. There's nothing going to change until you change. Nothing is changing in your life until you change. Happiness does not come into your life as a result of somebody making you happy. Happiness comes into your life of, as a result of you being happy, and then you attract things into your life that feed that happiness. That's the law of the universe. It's not a respect of persons. So if you're not, if things ain't working out in your life, it's because you are not practicing the law, or you don't understand what a law is. A true law is not a respect of persons. A true law is immutable. Immutable means that it doesn't change. Let's get the likes up. Let's get the likes up. That's because somebody said they, they're a constant source of negativity. That's because people, they, it's a habit. You can't, you gotta start studying, uh, studying this stuff. And you have to start with studying yourself because none of us are perfect. I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect either. You know, I have, I, you know, I have that. I'm still, I'm still a work in progress. I'm trying to root out certain things in my personality and some habitual ways of thinking that I can identify that I'm aware of, that I'm aware of, you know. And there are other individuals on YouTube who I listen to, and I'm like, some of them are younger than me. Some of them are younger than me, and I'm very impressed with their wisdom and the things that they say. I'm like, wow, this guy is really on top of it. His, his insights into things is, you know, some, this is admirable. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. A Kip 320. I appreciate it. And so, you know, we have to work out these habits in your mind, uh, you know, habits in your mind. And I'm going to give you a little something that you can do to work that out. OK. In any initiation, the first step in initiation is you have to know thyself. And in order to know thyself, you have to be brutally honest with yourself. That's why that's why the things that's why in all initiations, they look at that and see, can you be honest with yourself? Because if you can't be honest with yourself, you can't be honest with anybody else. So the first step is just self, you know, self-awareness and you have to look at yourself. So it's like, okay, sit back and meditate and look at yourself. And what is it about your personality? If you're a man, do you allow your emotions to rule you? Do you have outbursts? Do you, you know, are you easily angered? Are you impatient? Do you know, can you not, you know, like one of the things that doing talk radio did for me, it helped me allowing people to talk. If you listen to my old shows, I let people talk. People get pissed off at me. Man, why you let them talk? And sometimes people want to talk. They call in and they want to talk. I let them talk, you know. I used to do that back then. Sometimes I talk too long. I don't <laughs> do it as much. But you know what I'm saying? It's like without interrupting someone, you know, that demonstrates that you have patience. Are you patient? Can you control yourself? You know, are you worried easily? Do you worry about money? Do you worry about things? Do you th- do things like this? Do you do things like, well, I need I need one hundred and fifty dollars for the uh, electric bill, and then you get the one hundred and fifty dollars, but you don't pay the electric bill. You do something else with it because you think you have some other pressing need to come up that you need to put the one hundred and fifty dollars to. So I'm gonna make the electric bill wait a little longer. That right there shows a lack of faith because whatever you requested, it was given to you for that purpose. Serve the purpose and whatever need arises, that need will be addressed also. Once you start living your life in such a way where you demonstrate faith, you're going to, that's when you start getting a relationship with the creator of the boundless universe because you actually see that something is actually and consistently answering your call. But many of you have never put that to the test. 
That's why you lack faith. That's why they say you're not a person of faith. Because you don't believe in the unseen. You only believe in what you can see, hear, touch, taste, and smell. The corporal senses. You have no power. Because that is all an effect of some unseen cause. The power is always in the cause. You see in the Matrix where um, the Merovingian said causation? Go back and watch that. That was a very, very powerful. The people who wrote The Matrix was on top of it, man. That's one of the most powerful movies of all time. You need to go back and watch the Merovingian. We talking about Morpheus, Neo. He's talking about, he's talking about he run back to the Oracle because the only reason you're here because somebody told you to come here. He was explaining causation, where power is. Power is in the cause. The cause is always mental and spiritual. The effect is physical. Everything that you see on the physical plane has a mental and spiritual body first. And it started with a thought. How you think. If you think you can, you're correct. If you think you can't, you're correct. It's all on you. And this goes back for centuries. I read a lot of old esoteric information and the message never changes. That's the fundamental principle. It's always the same. So you have people who are looking at you and they're trying to do an assessment. Thank you, Steve Perrier. Thank you for the 1999, my brother. I appreciate you. You got people out there. They're looking at you and are trying to make an assessment of your character. Your character is a composition of your habits. So we have to root out negative habits that you have. That's one of the things in improving yourself as a man or a woman is that you have to be honest with yourself. You have to look at the deficiencies in your character and address them. So write them down on a piece of paper. Are you jealous? Are you fearful? Are you envious? Do you have hatred? All your negative, we're writing down all your negative characteristics, and then we're going to follow the principle of, principle of polarity. This is, al al this is alchemy that we're about to do. It's called mental alchemy, because everything has an equal and opposite. Everything in creation has two sides. Another reason why I'm giving you the, the Kabbalion and the seven principles, everything in creation has two sides. There's up, there's down, there's hot, there's cold. There's right, there's left. There's soft, there's hard. There's negative, there's positive. Everything has two sides. So your next step after you write down all these negative characteristics is to put their corresponding opposite. So if you have hate, love. Impatience, patience. I... What is the corresponding opposite of the neg negative characteristic? Once you've identified that, your next step is to draft you an affirmation as, that is composed of all of those positive characteristics that you are seeking, all right? and to root out all the negative. You cannot get rid of a habit. You have to replace a habit. All right? The universe abhors a vacuum, okay? So you don't get rid of anything. That's why it's alchemy. You have to change it from one state to the other state. You're changing it from one vibrational frequency to the next. All right? You're not pulling something out of the air. Okay, That's not how the universe works. It's called alchemy. Useless information. I appreciate that. <laughs> My mentor. Thank you, brother. I thank y'all for the 1999s, man. Somebody's on top of it. One and nine. Ain't no number. There's no number lower than one and no number higher than nine. And nine always goes back to nine. One time nine is nine. Two times, what is it? What, two times nine is 18. One plus eight is nine. Three times nine is 27. Two plus seven is nine. Four times nine is 36. Three plus six is nine. Just do that to, for infinitum and see what I'm talking about. It's something that you could do. Just study and think about. I want you to think about these things, what I'm saying. But... We're doing a status correction. The reason I'm talking about this today is because a lot of people, when they talk about status correction, they're only talking about paperwork, which is form. It's not dealing with substance. 
All right, form is addressed in the legal community. Substance is addressed in equity. Equity addresses substance. Statutes address form, procedures, things of that nature, form, the form of something. Well, we're gonna deal with the substance of something and to deal with the substance of something that begins and ends with you. Who are you? When you create some paperwork, are you copying somebody else's paperwork? And is the person's paperwork you copied, copied somebody else's paperwork? Is that you? How effective do you think that's going to be? What if all the paperwork you copied, you sent it into the government and they seen this like 100,000 times do you think that they can take you seriously? I wouldn't take anybody seriously who's copying, 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 copying. You think somebody's gonna take you seriously? I appreciate that, Vanessa Ebbing. My boyfriend and I love listening to you, Yusuf. You're the man, thank you for sharing your wisdom and intelligence to all of us. I appreciate you also, Vanessa. Thank you so much, I'm humbled. And I try my best, trust me. I, you know, I try to be an example. I'm not a perfect person by any stretch of the imagination, but I just try to, uh, you know, I just try to get my view on things and I appreciate people, you know, tuning in and listening to me. Thank you so much. Sometimes I'm in awe at the amount of people. You know what I really like? I want y'all to understand this too. You know what I really, really appreciate, what really fills my heart with pride is that I have people from all cultures all over the world listening to me. It ain't just black people, it's black, white, Hispanic, every race listens to me, everybody calls me, everybody asks me for consultations. It, it's, it's like, you know, it's like, wow, you know, it's like that, that trips me out, you know what I'm saying? That it, that it resonates with so many people from so many different cultures because I'm not a racist person. Even when I'm bringing up the Jews, it's like I hate doing that. Every time I have to mention and say something like that, it kind of bothers me. You know, it's like, why do I have to identify, single out these people? But the, the point is, it, it is, it's just true. It's like, it's like, yeah, you know, you see it, it's evidence right in front of your face. It's not all of them, but there is a, there are a group of people on the planet who think they are chosen. And I'm a, well, let me say this too. And if you're a Zionist looking, I know y'all watch my channel and I will say this to you. You do have some points. You have points. I understand your points that you make. The issue I take is that you are influencing people who are who have not been who have, who have not been conditioned properly. They're coming from environments where they haven't been exposed to certain information. OK, and you're keeping that information from them and then you're un, and they don't know how to protect themselves from some influence that you are foisting upon them. And then once you put that influence upon them, then you turn around and want to judge them in a certain kind of way. That's the issue I have. Why don't you do this? Why don't you make the information available to everyone and level out the playing field? And then we can see we can make a determination if you are the most intelligent people on the planet. I don't think that at all. We can make a determination of who the true people are, you know, as far as are they animals or not, you know. Let's 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 even out the playing field. And if and if and if if people are not, if they are, um, if they are not or you're equal, then why do you have to dumb them down? Aren't you already just so superiorly intelligent? Why do you have to work at dumbing somebody down? I don't understand that, you know, so I look at all these things that, you know, I read your documents and some of the things that you say, and, you know, I have to ask myself the question, you know, I was raised in a family that I, I, one thing I appreciate the family I came from is I was not raised with an inferiority complex to anyone. You know, I never looked at white people superior to me, Jews or anybody. I never looked at anybody superior to me. You know, you come to my house, people come to my house, it's full with black art all over the walls. My aunt, she owned a black art uh, a museum for a long time and she passed it on to me and my whole family, every other family, we put on black art on our walls because our philosophy is why are we put in another culture on our walls? Let's celebrate us and who we are. 
you know, and it's not any a knock against anybody else because I go in their house, they have their culture on their wall. And that's what I do. I put my culture on the wall because I am I have pride for my race, our accomplishments and the things we do. But I also honor and respect the accomplishments of other races. I, I, Jews have made many amazing contributions to humanity, as well as uh, Europeans, um, Africans, everybody has. I, I really I, I can see why God made the diversity the way it is, because that's what makes life worth living. You know, I get to try. Why, why do you think I want to travel and go to China? I don't want to go to China and see something looks like over here. I want to go experience their culture. I want to go experience different cultures all over the world. I want to see how different people live. The differences is what makes everything beautiful. If only we can learn to live in harmony with each other. 50-year journey, 3699, thank you so much. It says, to thyself be true, for when you're looking outside, there's nothing but you. Everything you see is a reflection of you. So look in the mirror and see what's true. Thanks for the hard love, bro. Your words of power. I appreciate you. I appreciate you. And that's absolutely correct. You know, I live my life on a daily basis, you know, because the reason I teach what I, I teach and I believe in what I believe in, because it is connected. I see the connection with esoteric sciences. All of this stuff, it, this information, the people who created this, it was never intended for us. We just happened upon the information. But when the deeper that you study it, when you start talking about sovereignty, when you start talking true sovereignty, when you start talking about private rights, you know, what are the responsibilities uh, that come along with that? You know, there's a responsibility that comes along with that. And that responsibility is that you have to govern yourself in a certain way accordingly. You have to be respectful to your brother. You know, you have to honor, you have to honor your partner, your honor. You know, these are different things that come along with this, you know, that the character. I had a 33 degree Mason. I need to go talk to him. He's down in Florida. It's an ex-girlfriend's father. He's a 33 degree. He's the only 33 degree Mason I've ever met in my life and personally know. Uh, he's 33 degrees. And, um, you know, one time we were sitting on the couch talking and uh, he had just got his 33 degree. He was in Atlanta to receive his uh, next degree. He had just, uh, I was uh, actually got a chance to talk to him and he was there and he's getting ready to go to his 33 degree. And uh, it was funny uh, because uh, he was sitting on the couch and we were just talking about, you know, the Masonic order. And he got up and just walked to the kitchen to get some water and came back. And he said, did you catch that? I said, no, he said, I hit you with about five different signs. And I didn't see nothing. I didn't see anything. You know, he was just saying this, and this is what's going on in the courtrooms too. They throwing these signs to the judges and all this kind of stuff, and I didn't see anything. And um, but basically he told me this one thing. He told me, he said, um, it all comes down to your character. And I know that that's true because in everything that I read, that is the first step. You have to address your character. What is your character like? You have to address that. That is that is a thing of life. And I can honestly tell you that I've experimented with some of this. And one experiment that I have experimented with that um, that I still struggle to try to do each and every day is to keep a positive outlook at all times. That is takes an effort, man, to stay positive all the time. Because that's where the test is coming in. The things that you see that are coming at you in life is to test you to see if you can maintain your integrity, to see if you can stay in your square, to see if you can stay positive. Thank you, Joe Sanchez. Yusuf, you're speaking profound truths. I admit I'm working on ridding myself of some of these vices. Needed this message. Thank you. You're absolutely welcome. Let me tell you a little story. Mr. Sanchez, um, I've you probably heard me tell this story before, but this is a story recently that happened to me. And well, within a couple of years, not recently, I'd say within the last, in the last seven, eight years. But if all of you know me, when I started High Frequency Radio, I started in, in California. I started in California. When I was in California, um, I started doing webinars and, you know, started making a little money doing webinars. And, um, I was driving a 1999 Nissan Maxima and I was dating a girl in Compton, California, and I was broadcasting from a Starbucks on Rosecrans and Central. 
in in Compton, California. Anybody in Compton know what I'm talking about? That Starbucks that's right there, Rosecrans. I think it's Rosecrans and Central where it intersects. Right there is a Starbucks and a T-Mobile and all those stores right there. I used to be in that Starbucks because I didn't have um, internet at the house. I didn't have a car at this time, and I was broadcasting from there. I just started high frequency radio, and um, uh. I had uh, I was dating a girl in Compton and we broke up and then uh, I started uh, uh, dating a uh, I was going to see a girl in in, uh, in uh, Seattle and she told me I could come up there and stay with her and I drove 18 hours up there to stay to see her and when I got up there she changed her mind and said I couldn't stay and closed the door in my face I just drove 18 hours and for a second a split second I got mad, but then I said, no, nah, I ain't going to let this bother me. And what, what am I going to do about it? Can't do nothing about it. I said, I'm going to drive back to Atlanta. And I said, I said, and this is what I always tell myself. This is what I always tell myself. I said, it must be something better. I must be being directed somewhere. I must be being directed somewhere. So I drove from Seattle, Washington to Atlanta, Georgia. It took me two weeks. It's a 42-hour drive. I only drove no more than four hours a day. And let me tell you why. Because driving from Seattle, Washington to Atlanta, Georgia, there's a lot of shit to see. America is a beautiful country. It is a beautiful country. And at some point in your life, if you cannot travel internationally, if you cannot travel internationally, if you can't get your passport or anything, that's okay. Bide your time exploring the United States of America until you can get to the point where you can go internationally. There's a lot to see. There's the Grand Canyon. There is Niagara Falls. Niagara Falls. There is Montana was so beautiful. The lakes up in Montana was so beautiful. The people were there were so cordial and nice to me up in Montana. Uh, South Dakota and North Dakota. And I just saw, I just saw rivers and, and lakes and mountains. I saw mountains. I just, that a movie can't do justice to. You looking at a mountain on a movie, that movie can't do just, you gotta go see that shit with your own eyes. And it was a spiritual, I, it, it was spiritual. And I, I drove it by myself in a 1999 Nissan Maxima. And let me give a shout out to Nissan. That car had over 200,000 miles on it and it didn't give a hiccup. It didn't give me no problem whatsoever. When they talk about the Nissan, them car salesmen tell you them Nissans, Toyotas, and uh, are some of the best cars. They are not fucking lying because that car did not give me. I drove that car. I, it was thunderstorms. I went through thunderstorms. It wasn't always sunny. Some I went through a storm, scared the shit out of me in Montana. You know, I, I was so happy. I was driving down a road that was so I drove like three hours and didn't see a single building or anything like that. And that was and it was thunderstorming like a tornado was coming. And finally, I came up on a hotel and I was. I was so relieved. <laughs> I was so relieved. But when I got back to Atlanta, I moved in with a friend of mine and um, I gave him $500. I didn't have any place to stay. So I called ahead. I said, say, man, I'm coming to Atlanta. I need a place to stay. So I got to his house. I said, yeah, I have a spare room. Got to his house, gave him $500. He went to work. Next day, I'm, I'm at the house. He's going to work. A U.S. Marshal knocks on the door. He's mean mugging. I'm, you know, I didn't had inter- run-ins with the Fed, so I'm seeing a U.S. Marshal. I'm like, what the fuck is a Marshal doing here? You know, I don't think he was a U.S. Marshal. He was a Marshal. I'm like, what? I say, open the door. I didn't have any. I haven't done anything wrong, so I opened the door, and he said, he's looking at me, frowning up, asked me who I was. He said, this is an eviction. My friend had not paid rent in two years, and I got there just yesterday, and they came in and threw all our stuff out on the front yard and I called him up I said say man I said I said man they they just evicted you I said you keep the $500 obviously you need it and I called an ex-girlfriend of mine I said hey look I need a place to stay can you help me out and she said um yeah you come stay and uh she said you stay one day and I'm thinking, ah, I'm gonna let go go over there. You know, it's my ex girl. I know how she really feels about me. I'm going. I know I can go over there and convince her to allow me to stay a little longer than one day. Got over there, stayed one day. Next day, she kicked me out. 
But I did do this when I left. I looked her in the face. I said, you know how I am. I always make things happen. And then I told myself, it must be something better. When, they, when I got kicked out of the house over there, they put our stuff out. I said, it must be something better. Every time something negative happened, I said, there must be something better. All right. So then I went and checked into a hotel. Didn't have a lot of money. I probably had about $3,000 in the bank. Uh, so my funds were running low. I didn't have, um, uh, you know, a lot of money. I was, um, I was, uh, I went into this Knights Inn hotel. If you're in Atlanta, you know, Knights Inn is like trashy, but it was real cheap. It's like, you know, $30 a night, $35 a night or something, just something quick and cheap. And, um, Oh, I'm, I'm in this hotel. And, and when I went into the hotel, I'm trying to build up my website. I don't know how to build a website, but I'm learning. I'm watching YouTube videos on how to build a website. And um, there's shootings, prostitution and everything going on all over the hotel. And I'm just like, this is not me. I, I just can't do this. You know, I just can't allow myself to lower my standards and be in an environment like this. So I went over on the other side of town and checked into a Holiday Inn about $120 a night and I went to work. I said, man, I got to get this website up. I got to get to because I'm not making any money or anything like that. Some guy had hijacked the dude who had made my website for me. I was selling my webinars on. He had took my website hostage and I wasn't making any money or doing anything. I was just trying to find a place to place to stay. Wasn't making any money. Uh, I, I, I said, look, I'm going to learn how to build a website myself. Uh, um, um, how to build a WordPress or website. Um, I forgot dude's name. I'll look uh, up in a minute, but uh, he, that guy, I thank him. I'm always referring to him because I went and studied for a week and I almost gave up. And within one week, I figured it out. And I was in the Holiday Inn. It's about seventh or eighth day, me staying there. And when I put up the website, and I want to thank everybody out there who supports me. When I put up that website and started selling my webinars, I made $25,000 in three days. And... I couldn't believe it. When 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 they say y'all people y'all were buying websites every almost every minute something was being sold. Almost every minute. And it went for 3 days straight like that and at the end of 3 days it stopped. And I was and I was like, "Wow, you know, let me tell you something, man. There, there were times in my life where um I I uh I felt like, "Damn, it really is a god." One of those times, you know, like this feeling, the first feeling I got like that is when I graduated from high school. You know, I'm like, man, I was I was walking on air, you know, getting my diploma, you know, and everything, walking across that stage, you know, and I was like, wow, I was so, so happy that it happened. I was so proud. The next time feeling I got like that is when I got out of prison. <laughs> that was like, oh, my God, you know, it was like the feeling I had. And then the next time I got that same feeling was that day when everybody was buying those wet. I was like, I was walking on air. I was like, wow, there really is, there really is somebody watching out. Because the whole time I refused to allow myself to fall into negativity. I refused to give up. I would not allow no, everything that was happening to me was negative. But I did not succumb to the negativity. I just kept telling myself it must be something better. It must be something better. This is why I didn't get this, because there's something better coming. Oh, I didn't get this. There's something better coming. I kept telling myself that. Even though I was getting punched in the gut. Imagine you being in a boxing match, and somebody gut checking you, and then you have, oh, it must be something better. <laughs> That's what the feeling was like. You know, you're getting gut checked, but you saying, like, look, I got I to gotta keep this positivity. My next goal was to get a place to stay. So I needed, I didn't have any credit. I didn't have anything. So I, I was trying to get an apartment. I got a, I got a record and everything. I'm trying to get an apartment and, but I got money. So I'm feeling confident that I can get a place to stay because I got money. I just need to get a place to stay. And in my mind, I'm thinking, Hey, if somebody offers me a place to stay. Hell, I'll pay the year up. I'll pay the rent up for a year. And cause I just wanted to get stable. And, um, I applied to these apartment complexes and everybody was denying me. And I remember the last lady who denied me, um, I was on the phone with her and I said, ma'am, I said, look, I'll pay. If y'all worried about my credit or anything like that, I will pay 
the rent up six months. I said six months in advance, I think. I said, I'll give y'all six months rent up front, advance. She hung the phone up in my face. I was sitting in a parking lot. I'll tell y'all exactly where I were for people in Atlanta. I was in, um, I was in um, right in front of LA Fitness and Camp Creek in the Camp Creek Shopping Center. I was at LA Fitness in that, in that parking lot up there. And I was sitting in that 1999 Nissan Maxima and I almost got beat down. I, like when she hung up the phone in my face, I just stood, I was sat in the car and was just thinking, trying to think of my next step. And then the phone rang. And it was my friend. He said, hey, man, what's going on, man? I said, hey, man, I ain't spoke to you in a long time. Blah, blah, blah. He said, what you trying to do? I said, man, I'm trying to find a place to stay right now, but I can't. These apartment complexes. He said, oh, man, no problem. He said, I got my friend of mine. They just uh, redid a whole house, and he's renting the house. Let me take you over there. Went over there. Huge. Six-bedroom, three-bath house. They were putting, they were just in there putting in uh, brand new floors, cabinets, everything in there. And he rented that spot to me for less, almost two times less than any of the apartments I were trying to, I was trying to get. It landed on my feet. After that, my next step was to get my credit together. And then I proceeded to that. So the things that I'm teaching you, everything that I teach you, I've experienced. I don't like talking about things I haven't experienced. I really don't. I don't like talking about things I haven't experienced. Um, but when I think back about that, man, that was, I, I just remembered. And then I, so now I try to keep practicing that. Like, you know, even when you're trying to elevate yourself financially, you know, you reach certain plateaus and, you know, you and you experience certain setbacks and things like that. You got to understand that it's kind of like the stock market. It goes up, down, but the whole time is going up. It's, it's, how, it's, how, it's kind of how your life go when you when you're being positive. It goes just like the stock market. You're going up. Then it do take that decrease. The decrease is the test to see. And OK, he's going to stay positive. Go back up and hit him again. Oh, he's going to stay positive. He got up and hit him again. It's just doing that. But you're 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 you're, you're elevating but you're being tested along the way. Faith without works is dead. Then you start seeing how money works. You start seeing that there's a spiritual, um, you see there's a spiritual component to everything. You know, the cause and effect. And you start studying that. And, 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 and then you have to catch yourself. I saw Muhammad Ali. He made a nice statement when he was saying, you know, like the distractions, the women, you know, you start elevating and here come the women, you know, and then, then you get an all point on that. And, you know, and then you have to you have to stay keep you have to stay on your path and purpose and not succumb to that. If people, any of you who studied the Quran Circle 7, I can't remember if it's the Quran Circle 7 or the Aquarian Gospels where Jesus went through those seven tests, and his last test was a woman, a beautiful ass woman. Because the power of a woman, you know, are you going to be taken off your path? You don't let nothing take you off your path, gentlemen. Not a woman, not nothing. Because it's always something better coming. <laughs> it's always something better around the corner. But anyway, I'm going to take some calls. I'm going to take some calls. I'm going to take some calls. Call in number is 563-999-3616. You're listening to the hottest radio network on the planet. Radio. I forgot about my drops and everything. I miss my drops. <laughs> I had a professional radio station make my drops for me. I miss my little drops I had. But anyway, call number is 563-999-3616. Hit, listen to the uh, recording, tell you to hit one. So you raise your hand, I think. Because I can't answer your question unless you raise your hand. You know, hit one when you call in. And you can speak to the host. I think it's one. 
Is it one, two, something? I forgot the number. It's been a long time. I'm, I'm, I'm simulcasting on blog talk right now. I, okay, so we have, let me put this up. I see you, I see you, I see you. I see you with your hand up. All right, so let's go to Missouri, the show me state. Missouri, hit you first. Missouri, you on the line, what's on your mind? Hit your mute button. I guess not. Hold on. 414. Wait a minute, hold on. Let me make sure I y'all can hear me. Can y'all hear me? I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure y'all can hear me. 678 oh, can you hear me? Six seven eight. Can you hear me? All right, y'all can hear you now. I don't know what everybody else, the problem everybody else having. 678-0682, Georgia. You on the line. 678-08, can you hear me? I just heard you a few minutes ago. What happened? Let me see if there's something over here. Oh, let me see if there's something over here. No, it's not over here. Everything's cool over here. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay, yeah. Six seven eight oh six eight two. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Hey, peace and love. What's going on, brother? How you doing? Hello, hello, hello. Yeah, can you hear me? Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, that was me. I'm sorry. I had my mic muted. <laughs> Yeah, my mic, man. Can you hear me now? I hear you. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you now. That was my fault. That was on me. I'm sorry. I apologize. <laughs> anyway, go ahead. You had a question. First time caller, long time listener. <laughs> What's going on? What's going on? What you got for me? Let me, let me mute the um, let me mute your, your broadcast so I don't... Um myself echoing. Oh, nope. man, I just wanted to say, man, it's a pleasure to even talk to the guy right now. Uh, okay, it's a pleasure to talk to you, too. Thank you. I appreciate that, man. I've been to you for, I don't know how many years now. It's the first time I said, let me go ahead and get a guy call. <laughs> uh, it just so happens that right now, I'm actually, um, it's kind of maybe, I hope it's not too far off the subject, but I'm dealing with a, um, a case where I had, like, seven judges still on my case. In the um in the master court. Okay. And now I got three court two judges in my case, and, and you gotta see, I'm kind of excited to talk to you first of all. And I'm also excited about the work I've been doing with this case for the past two years. And it just so happens that now I got a, a man Damon hearing coming up. So in my man Damon hearing, I was like, I'm like nervous because I got jerked on all the judges on the previous platform dealing with the lower court. Now I'm about to go before the super or higher court. And I was trying to see if there's any um, pointers you can give you know, from your personal experience that you've gone through. Because one thing I was telling one of my brothers was that um, I've never heard people talk about talk bad for mandamus. I had a mandamus hearing, but I do hear them talk bad when you have your lower court hearing. So I was wondering to just, you know, find out from you your experience. Well, I've never had a mandamus hearing, but a writ of mandamus is a writ to from, from a higher court to a lower court to force them to do some sort of action that they have a duty to perform. Um, that's what a mandamus is. So my first thing is, well, what is it that you're trying to get a lower court to do? What is it they're not doing? So I had the lower court, I put a, I put a couple, I like put like seven motions in for the judge to um, do a summary judgment. And they gave me back um, on a summary judgment for well, seven motions, but there's one motion for default, one motion for summary judgment, uh, notice respect rights and so forth. But He's the only part of room on one motion. If I put that motion in, like say October 2021, 
And then I gave warning to the chief judge in Massachusetts court, as well as to the judges themselves, saying that um, they have 90 days rule according to the according to their rule or their, uh, their code. They have 90 days rule in a county with 100,000 um, uh, inhabitants or more. They have 90 days rule on. So I kept giving them a notice saying, you know, please rule on the motion. Because the only way they can extend that is if they get agreement from the party or they have some extenuating circumstances. But she didn't rule, the judge didn't rule on the motion until maybe 200 some days later. And then she tried to knock both tongues it. And I gave her a case law saying she can't knock both tongues, uh, judicial um, uh, non performance of the duty, so forth, and the third. And so from that, they want to try to uh, support the trial and, and everything else. But so the mandamus was put in before she even ruled on the, uh, on the motion. So I'm trying to get the higher court to acknowledge the fact that the master rule 41 in a preamble it says that as long as it does not um, conflict with constitution or substantive law. And so the master rule 41, which is the denial of summary judgment, is in co- conflict with the constitution as well as its own preamble. Okay, well, there's a certain things that I'm listening to you, I can, I'm picking out. First of all, you did a motion. A motion is a request. You know, um, rights is what you have to be asserting, and a right is enforceable through a contract. So you had to have some sort of contract. This is why we talk about administrative processes and things like that on this show. Um, so, you know, that that's what threw me out when you said a motion. You're trying to get them. A motion is a request, you know, for, you know, for, uh, uh, you know, the court to take some sort of uh, action. You know, your rights is what you want to be in there asserting. And you want to do that in an equity court in an equity court when you start talking about constitutional protections it gets kind of like iffy because as a 14th amendment citizen you really don't have the constitutional protections that you think you do they give lip service to the constitution but they don't follow the constitution i remember i had an attorney you know when you know when you know this information like i do and you have a a a a conversation with certain attorneys you have some of them that will be transparent and tell you what's really up you know i had one straight up tell me is the constitution don't mean shit in these in these courts and he's right. They will even say sometimes if you if you mention the Constitution one more time, I'm going to put you in contempt because you're in an admiralty proceeding, which is usually a condition of contract. Admiralty is dealing with contracts. So it's some sort of contractual situation that pulled you into that particular situation. Do you mind me asking you, what is it this involving? Is it criminal or civil? Uh, civil. Small claim. It's a civil claim, okay? So it's something to do with some money. Right. Okay, it's something to do. So we had a private contract. Okay, go ahead. So the private contract. Okay, go ahead. I apologize. No, go ahead. Go ahead. I'm listening. I had a private contract with a, uh, a company do business, and they reneged on their portion of the contract. Uh, it was private, and I brought it to the court for, for equity, or let's say for um, enforcement of the contract. Uh, in dealing with when I put my motions in, I also was talking to the judge in private. Privately, this is what I was saying as far as um, uh, what they were supposed to be doing. If I don't know if it maybe context would be to where the higher court, the superior court, basically had issued the man, not they didn't issue the mandate, they issued a hearing for the mandate. So, I don't know if that was to give me value to my argument because, of course, with you know, mandamus, they don't really issue those too much. Um, but even to have a hearing would mean that the chief judge is very yeah. saw value in the he saw that, so he actually scheduled a hearing. Yeah, that's what so, I'm saying. If you got a hearing, if you got a hearing on it, that 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 means you. Hey, li- listen, when something like that happens. You need to, this is an opportunity for you to learn something. You need to make sure that you are prepared. You need to study everything you can on mandamuses, read all the case law that you can, and you need to be prepared that day when you go in there. I'm not an expert on mandamuses. I've only done one in my life, and that's when I was um, in jail. And, uh, you know, they were doing the same thing to me. You know, I'm sending in, I didn't, that's back when I didn't understand the difference between a motion and a demand. You know, you have a demand and you'd have a motion. And, um, you know, motion is a request. A demand is for rights. Like you do a demand for a speedy trial. You don't do a motion for speedy trial. It's a demand for speedy trial because I have a right to a speedy trial. You know, so I don't request my rights. If I may, huh? If I, if I, may, mm-hmm. if I may offer the idea, it's something I actually, that's paramount that was left out. So we had a hearing on the lower court um, 
for uh, a motions hearing, right? So the right. motions hearing, the judge only addressed he only addressed the summary um, summary motion, but it was like five other motions that she left out. Uh, one of them, of course, is for uh, uh, observance of rights, and another one was for due process. Another one was for uh, it was a couple of them. But the point being, so at the end of the hearing, the judge said we're going to have trial on this particular day, right? So. Uh, the opposing counsel said that he had a conflict the day before, but then he said he's available for that day. So the day comes up, I go into court, but opposing counsel doesn't show, and the judge, the trial judge, says that he doesn't see it on the docket. I say that doesn't have nothing to do with me. That's not like an error with the court. So basically, me, the judge, we had an oral agreement. That's an oral contract. So I'm arguing or holding them that contract. You got that on. That you got that on record. You got that on record. You got a stenographer there that recorded that. No, no, no. What I did was I took it and I put it into the record because um, it wasn't an actual trial. If you put something into the record, you got to get the approval of both sides. If you're going to do something like that, it got to be both sides have to agree to that. You just can't put something into the record like that, huh? What I did was I did. I didn't mention the process. I basically was saying that um, so the, so five days after we had that particular hearing, I put in a record what was said, what was said by the judge, what was said by the first counsel, and what, what I was saying. And basically, the fact that we we supposed to be on. Well, so what you're, you're doing is you're constructing you're time. constructing a record, and you have to get the consent of the opposing counsel for that to be effective. You're but constructing I, a record. But would they not? Would they not have to object to it? I mean, I mean, I have never done that. You know, I've never constructed a record like I just I've done the research. The reason I'm so big on having a stenographic record of the proceedings, because I've done a lot of research on that. That's why I'm telling you this right now, that you can. There are instances where you can uh, reconstruct a record if there was not a stenographer, but you need the consent of the opposing counsel to do that. I've never done that myself. Now, if it turn, you know, you have a, what's your ori tennis. Um, which is like um, what that means, like an oral motion. You've or, you've orally made this uh, agreement uh, with the judge. Um, sometimes also the reason that they don't answer other motions is because the answer of one motion takes care of all the other ones. You'll see them put that in their opinions uh, mm. uh, a lot of times as well. I'd really have to look at your paperwork to see um, exactly, you know, because I'm right, right now we're just conversating. And so I'm just basically giving you some generalities of how I understand things to be. But um, what I would concentrate on right now is that hearing for the uh, writ of mandamus. And make, cause a, a writ of mandamus is not a very easy thing to write. Um, I had a, an attorney friend, we were having a drinks one day and we were having a discussion about writ of mandamus. And he was telling me that, you know, about a writ of mandamus and the importance of making a record. You know, when you go into the courtroom, you're not there. That's something that's always catching people off guard. They go in court, and they think they're there to talk to the judge or things. You're not there to talk to the judge. You're there to make a record. You're there to make a record because if you need to appeal, you can take it to another court. But when you take it to another court, that court needs to see what was said in the other court. And the only way they can do that is look at the record. So it's hard, very difficult to appeal. Any, uh, let me just take, get, like, tell y'all this. When you don't have a stenographic record of the proceedings, the appellate court is already going to side with the trial court and assume or presume that they did everything correctly. That's by default when you don't have a stenographic record of the proceedings. So you need to always have, when you go into court, the first thing you do, and it's your responsibility to do this, is to make sure you have a stenographer that's there. Having a stenographer puts oh, the... My policy. Huh? Say what? I'm about to add the idea of that I have witnesses in the court when you can sign affidavits to the conversation I was having. You, you could, but you know, I, you know I, don't, I haven't seen any case law on the effectiveness of an affidavit. The affidavit can be subject to um, you know, to cross examination, but you know, I, I can tell you, I can tell you already, they're not going to go through all of that. And you're going to have to uh, move the court to go through all of that. Cause in they mind, they saying, motherfucker, why you just didn't get a stenographer? Why? You know, it's like, you got to understand it's called, uh, you got to understand this, this judicial It's called the judicial wasting the judicial resources of the court by wasting a time. Everything with them is time. So if you're not, you sitting here 
and you know you writing all this paperwork they're not reading all of that shit i can tell you right now you know uh, the, the best course of action in dealing with them if it's if it's not some major case where they got to give all their attention to keep your documentation down to a page or two or something like that make sure that you fill out all of that like if it's a summary judgment you should already have the summary judgment filled out so they can just sign it you know that's how they are they just want to sign some shit they don't want to type up nothing they don't want to do anything like that and that's why i'm i'm I'm, I'm telling people that the best thing, let me tell you, let me, get, let me tell y'all something. I'm, and everybody listen to me real quick, very, very good right now. The best thing when I was in jail, the best thing that happened to me in jail that helped me with my paperwork is when I got a forms and pleadings book. That was the best thing, man. That that took my whole game to a whole nother level. That's why I'm so proficient at writing court documents right now today. You cannot depend on your raw intelligence to write documents. Attorneys don't even do that. Everybody follows a template. They have a template for a writ of mandamus. I can tell you because that's where I got mine at. You're going to have to change what's in it so it is, you know, of course, you know, addresses your particular situation, but they're going to have a template. The importance of having a template is to ensure that all the necessary elements are present in there that they're looking for, like jurisdiction, uh, you know, the uh, standing of the parties, you know, just different things like that. When you follow a template, that template is going to make sure those things are addressed. Now, you are pro se litigant and they are supposed to give you some leeway, but I can tell you from experience that they don't. They're supposed to, but they don't, <laughs> you know, they're expecting you. Their attitude is if you feel like, you know, law, because they say a, fool, a, a person as itself or an attorney as a fool for counsel or however that thing goes. I, I can understand why they say that is because people don't do the things that I'm saying right now. You have to study these things, you know, like every judge and like, for instance, judges, um, they want a certain font. There's usually Arial, Courier or New Times Roman. Those are usually the three fonts that are used in, in law. You want double spacing. Uh, certain judges want a certain point, you know, like 12 points is standard. There are some judges want 14 points on their on that. You know, it's just things like that. So, you know, those are things if you really want to impress a judge, you go take your time to study all of that. You'll take your time to study all of that and understand those things. So when you do file your paperwork, make sure your caption of your pleading is correct. All right. Everything. And I, like I said, I would strongly suggest that you go get a forms and pleadings book by Matthew Bender. He's probably the um, the number one person that puts out forms and pleadings book. Um, then you have American Jurisprudence has one. You have Westlaw has one. Each of the individual states have their own forms and pleadings book. OK, that if you want to write paperwork for court, OK, it is necessary that you get that book. It is really not an option. I really wouldn't even say it's an option because right. when when you just start writing stuff like I started out doing it on my own, you just writing shit now comes blah, 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 because you've seen somebody else do some stuff and everything. You're like, nah, you know, you're trying to write stuff off the top of your head. It's so much that you're leaving out. You're not trained in law. So you need some guidelines to go by. And that is why I strongly suggest, strongly suggest that you get a forms and pleadings book so you can understand the proper way these documents need to be drafted. I did. I did. Um, I did listen to you when you um, originally talked about Ma Matthew Bender's forms of pleading. Because yeah. I couldn't get one, I ended up going to the State Law Library and, and mm -hmm. started using their um, form that they had to try to Well, tell me your experience. Um, so hold on. Hold, hold on for a second. Tell me your experience of that. What do you think about that 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 book, forms and pleadings? What what did you what did you get from it? Oh. It, it, like you said, it just it just takes to another level. Like I'm like, oh, it's so simple. It's not like the, the attorneys are actually drafting up off the top of the head. They're just filling in um blanks on a, on a piece of paper. They're filling in blanks. <laughs> I was like, wow, these guys. And this when I went to court, I was talking to an attorney, right? I was talking to an attorney, the opposing counsel. I was I was just recognize how they, how you guys kept talking. All they know is the procedure. They don't know the law. So he kept talking. I was like, which law? What law are you talking about? He couldn't even say the law. He didn't know. He started stuttering. And I was like, oh, my goodness. It started all coming together. They're just, they're just drafting up these forms based on this. They don't really know what they're talking about. Even though it says on the, on the form, OCDA, they don't even go look up the code to even get an understanding. Sometimes sometime, I've seen like situations where they still have the name of the last person that they made the pleading for, and they had a new person. They still forgot to erase the name of the last person because it's a template. 
You know what I'm saying? I've seen situations like that. And that's why I tell people also to get the state court bench book. Like if you're in a foreclosure or something like that, that's going to uh, take some of the mystery away from like unlawful detainers and um, and dispossessory actions. Because now you see that the judge is following a script. And, and, and the script tell him, if you do this, he do this. If you do this, he do this. And you're like, damn, here's the goddamn playbook right here. You got to understand these are administrative right. courts. What does administrative court mean? An administrator cannot do their own thing. They, they, let me read the definition. Hold on, bro. I got I to gotta show everybody this. When we're talking about an administrator, we're talking about an administrator. They call themselves judges. I, I know that's what they, you all hear. They say, well, the judge. Y'all, y'all like to say that. These ain't real judges. A judicial judge is under Article... A real judge is under the judiciary, the judicial branch of government. But you have judges in Article 1 and Article 2. They call them judges, but what they are, they're administrators. They're like, um, they have this title judge. Like, they, they, everything looks the same. The courtroom looks the same. They have a clerk in there. They have a bailiffs in there. They have all the same stuff. All the pomp and everything that you see is in there. Thank you, Mike Sinatra. Hey, use of the full CPN and business credit classes aren't on the university. I'll get that. I'll, we'll get to that. All right. Um, but thank you, Mike Sinatra. I see. I see what you're saying. I'll look. I'll look. 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 Sign back in later today. And uh, but thank you for bringing that to my attention because you may be right about that. But let me get back on this administrative court. The administrative courts. All right. So it looks the same, but administrators follow like a script. OK, and they have some leeway, but it's things. They, so let me read the definition of this to you so you can get some understanding about administrative. Why you're in an administrative court, you are in administrative court. So we go to um, let me get on SPC University real quick. And we go over here to our legal dic- dictionaries. And you can see we got. And I think uh, administrator. I'm trying. Let me see. Let me make sure I got administrator. Administrator has a. Um, they have a a duty to perform. Okay, you start right here. Let me let me let me make sure I'm doing this right first. Control F. I got Black Law Fourth Dictionary. It says an administrator, in the most usual sense of the word, is a person to whom letters of administration. That is an authority to administer the estate of a deceased person has been granted by the proper court. Yeah, the representative it, of a limited authority duties are to collect aspects of estate, pay its debts, and distribute res- residue to those titles. Right, right, right. Let me hold on. Let me let me pull this up real quick. Yeah, this is it right here. You're right. Okay, so if y'all look at the screen, if you're looking at the screen. You see this right here, all of these these definitions I pulled out of Black's Law Dictionary. All right, so you got administrator, uh, right here, what he was just reading, a person who manages or heads a business, public office, or agency. This comes out of Black's Law, 8th edition. Two, a person appointed by the court to manage the assets and liabilities of the intestate decedent. Okay, in the restatement of property, all right. Now, here's the expert commentary. When acting to enforce a statute and its subsequent amendments to the present date, the judge of the municipal court is acting as an administrative officer and not in a judicial capacity. Courts in administering or enforcing statutes do not act judicially but ministerially. Now, this is the word I want to look up, ministerial. Okay, I was trying to get to this word. An administrator has a ministerial duty to perform. Okay, so now look up the word ministerial. The word ministerial. Ministerial duty, ministerial. Okay, it has a ministerial duty to perform. All right, so we got to the word. Let me see if I can get back over here. That was the word I was trying to think of, not administrator. Administrator has a ministerial duty to perform. So ministerial. That which is opposed to judicial, that which involves obedience to instructions but demands no special discretion, judgment, or skill. Exactly. Now, you see, that's what an, that defines an administrator. They don't have no discretion, judgment, or skill. 
And that's why they'll tell you they're following somebody's directing them to do something, which is the legislature. The leg- That's why if you look in a judicial hearing on TV, I watch all this stuff. You'll have Congress, some senators up there grilling a judge. Why were you doing this? They're grilling, they're grilling administrative law judges because they're their employees. You don't see them up there grilling Supreme Court justices. They're not grilling them because you have a because they on their level. A, a Supreme Court, a true judge is on the same level as a as as a, as a, as, a, as a senator or a, a representative. He's just a different branch of government. But an administrative law judge is subordinate to the legislative officers, the senators, and all of that. So they'll call them in and start grilling them. What are you doing over here? We didn't give you permission to do this X, Y, and Z. So when you go into a U.S. District Court. Or when you go into any type of superior court nowadays, you're going into an administrative court and you're sitting in front of an administrator and they're enforcing statutes. So right there, they're telling you that anytime a judge is enforcing a statute, he's not acting in a judicial capacity. He's acting ministerially. So when you look up the word ministerial, you see what it is. He's following a script. They all follow scripts. It's procedures. This is why I say when you do statutes, it's about form. You don't get to substance and you're dealing with equity. Right, so maybe I might have looked at it wrong, if you could correct me, because like, so since they are, this, that court is doing mattress, and one of the reasons why they said they denied, they, they denied the, uh, the request was because of a master rule. So then what I did was, just like Malachi Yoke taught, you know, you got to know the definition of every word. So I went right. inside the, the preamble, I read the Uniform Rules of Matric Court of the State of Georgia, and page one, rule one, the preamble is states, it is not the intention, nor shall it be the effect of these rules to conflict with the Constitution or substantive law. I agree, I agree with now, that. I agree with that. That was my argument. But, oh, oh, hold on, you're making an that's argument, but, but they they thing is this is what you got to understand. I understand what you're saying. What the protection against conf- conflicting with the Constitution is what procedures are for. The reason everything within their scope of their duties, everything they do follows a procedure. The procedures are put in place to ensure there are no conflicts with the Constitution. So you can only attack these people procedurally. This is why abatement processes are so important because an abatement, although they refer to it as a dilatory tactic, which means delay tactic, what it does, though, is it makes them go back and do the procedure correctly because they always just skip steps in what they're supposed to do. This is also the point of also appealing something. When you appeal something, what you're appealing is the procedure they followed. All the appellate court is going to do, unless they do a de novo review, I they're just going to review and see where all the where all the procedures followed. If all the procedures are followed, they're going to rule in, in favor of the trial court. That's it. But in this case, they they saw out of procedure because the rule says, according to their statutes, that they rule within ninety days. That's they have no. You're right. That. That's the, um, you're right. You're absolutely right. I forgot that about that. You did say that. You're absolutely and you and you are absolutely and you and trust me, they do do that. They did that to me. Like they, they tried to give me a a, a, a um a, a, a psych you know psychiatric examination. Well, only supposed to hold me thirty days. Held me one hundred and twenty days. <laughs> You know, and what can you do? You know, you're trying to, you know, I did writs of mandamus. I was doing all kinds of stuff because you're right. They violate their procedures all the time. And that's when you got to get at them. Now, back then, I didn't know how to get at them. But that's when you start attacking their bonds, putting liens on their ass and doing shit like that. Because you are exactly right. They will do that shit. You know, like they supposed to do something in 30 days. And they won't do the shit. You know, they just sit on their ass and let you sit there like, fuck you, nigga. I get to it when I get to it. You know, they do that. They do do that a lot of times now. I'm not even going. I'm not even going the front you're absolutely correct they do that shit especially to pro se litigants they do that so what would be, a, what would be the remedy in that case Can a writ of mandamus you, you did it uh, you did it a writ of mandamus you got a hearing coming up that's what i said prepare for your man prepare for your hearing you did a writ of mandamus so the, 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 uh, the higher you get up the higher you get up the more you get exposed to real judges the higher you go up the ladder the higher you go up the ladder, the more you get exposed. That's why the majority of people went on appeal. They'll tell you that. That's why my friend told me, who's the attorney, he said, man, I don't go out to butt fuck Georgia. He was in Georgia, too. He said, um, he said, I go out somewhere with a case, and he said, the prosecutor, the judge, and the sheriff all cousins, you know, some country town, you know, <laughs> and, you know, they running everything. He said, I'm not going out there to win. I'm not going to win. He said, I'm going out there to make a record. He said, I'm going to beat them on appeal because the appellate courts ain't, ain't so behind. Huh? 
I was gonna say, so when the judge said that she, when she said that we're gonna have trial, trial is gonna begin on this date, and trial doesn't begin on that date. What is recourse to that? Well, if we're having a trial, that means there's some the argument. Point. You keep using the word <laughs> argument. You're using the word argument. I mean, if there's an ar- a trial, is a trial is for fact finding. Okay, that's all it is. There's some facts right. in dispute. So, you know, if you're in a trial, okay, that's what it is. They're called a fact finder. It's either the bench trial or jury trial. Either way, they both call fact finding, fact finders or fact triers. A fact trier is a judge in a bench trial. A fact trier is a jury in a jury trial. But either way, they both are trying to accomplish the same thing, make a determination on what the facts are, because you cannot apply the law until you know what the facts are. So you have facts and law. So before you can get to the law, what are the facts? So if, if we're having a trial, what is the issue? Is a material issue a fact? What is it? But, but, but they didn't have trial. That's the thing. On the day she said they was going to have trial, I go in for trial, and the trial judge says that, well, it's not on the calendar. Well then, yeah, we had a motion well, let me hold, 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 hold. It is your responsibility. Okay. Uh, you, you, you know what a rule nisi is? Rule nisi. Rule not R U L E. Yeah, rule nisi, rule nisi, rule nisi. Yeah. You know what that is? I'm not too familiar, but I'm familiar with the word. All right, rule nice. Uh, a rule or order upon condition that is to become absolute unless cause is shown to the contrary. They usually, when you put in a, a rule nice, uh, if, I, if I got this right, I might be wrong. I might, I might be uh, talking about the wrong thing. But usually you go in and you request that from the um, clerk, and the clerk is going to put it on the calendar. If you pro se, that's your responsibility to do that. Your responsibility is to monitor the docket and make sure, and, and then you question that. If it's not on, so you got to understand the judge, it's not the judge's responsibility, man, to make sure something's on the calendar. That's not the judge's response. The judge is just the referee. He just come into the game, man. You know what I'm saying? You come into the game, you expect me to do like, look, man, this ain't my responsibility. It's your responsibility. You come in and try to put this on me. That's what he's saying. And like, look, man, I'm just here to referee this game. You got you file stuff in court. You when you file stuff into the record, you just tell the other side, okay, this is what I'm coming to fight with. They file their stuff. This is what you coming to fight with. Now we're gonna come into the court when we're finna battle. We're gonna have a stenographer over there. They're gonna make a record of the proceeding, and the judge is gonna referee it. That's why it's called court. Like, you know, like a like a tennis court. They hit the ball, you hit the ball on his side, he gotta hit it, he got 20 days to hit it back. He hit it back to you, you got 10 days to hit it back. Court, court putting stuff on the calendar is your responsibility. And that's just not, that can also be looked at a clerical error, which is reversed. It could be, it could be. What Do you have evidence of that? You have evidence of that it was a clerical error? Do you have a document so had, that you filed with the clerk that's stamped, time, state, and, and stamp that you can present as evidence in the court showing, look, Jan, I went up here and I filed this. Why is this not on the calendar? Agree. I did. I did. This is, why, this is one of the reasons why I believe that the, um, the chief judge is allowing to have the mandamus hearing based on it. Okay. Uh, I, said this from, I, I agree. A, a I agree with that. The, um, I agree with that. So I did everything in the private. And so what would, so, cause we had another hearing, right? And, and one judge that was over the hearing, he stopped the hearing in the middle of it because I argued with her. I said that the judge, I said the previous judge said this was a separate trial months ago and I, I appeared for trial. And she, and so the, so the judge asked the um, opposing counsel, he said, yes, your honor. He did, um, he did set it for a trial, but it was moved from the calendar. He lied on that part because it was never on the calendar. But I, just, I went with it. She said, hold on. And so she goes and she calls the other judge. And then she comes back, she says, well, the judge told me that this was supposed to be set for trial, that we weren't supposed to have a hearing this day. So that right there is already given, well, it's evidence based on her testimony, that's the judge's testimony, that this was supposed to be set for trial months ago. So, the, But the day the months ago she's talking about, I appeared in court for trial. Okay, you got a writ of mandamus, man. Make sure you have all your record. Make sure you have your evidence. And I understand you're right in what you're saying, everything you're saying. I'm just sitting here playing devil's advocate, making sure you got your I's dotted and your T's crossed because that's what you have to have when you're dealing with these people. You better make sure your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed, that you understand the rules of evidence. I would read the evidence code in Georgia. All right, go through that. Understand what constitutes evidence, slight evidence, full evidence, all of these different things, and then pre- and then present your case. There is a doc. There is a there is a word in the um, in the Sirach, which is in the Catholic Bible. It says, "Study your words, and you will be listened to." 
You know, you have to study, man. You have to study to show yourself approved and then you'll be listened to. So, you know, just you sound like you but listening to you. I, I, I give you your props, bro. You you on top of it. You're doing your study. You're studying. I'm, I'm impressed. You know, every time I tell you something, you you got it covered. You you saw that your only step I can hear. The only thing I can hear is you got a written mandamus. They gave you a hearing. They gave you a hearing. Be ready. I want to say thank you. I'm not going to hold it time. I want to say thank you. I've been listening for years. I feel you know, point with it all. You know, I was shooting the Dr. Malachi for, for years. You know, I feel you know, all the love. Can't you, tell, can, can't you tell he gave us good foundation? No, bro. I don't care what they say about the man. He made everybody that was in that organization. We solid. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> I'm like, yo, I want to thank you for being a call. My first time call, long time listener. I yo. Thank you. And what you just did also was give me uh, not really much of validation, but confidence that what I've been doing is on point. I I, I, can, I couldn't find no holes in it. Yeah, I couldn't find no holes in it. You're doing good. You know what I'm saying? Sounds like you you got you, you know. Just be ready. That's all I can say. You know, you never know what's going to happen. Um, you know, just make sure you um, just just present your case. Um, understand it's not about right or wrong. Get that out your mind. That's a mistake we make going into these courts because our mind be framed with right and wrong. We we got to understand is what can you prove? That's what that's another thing my attorney friend told me. He said, it ain't about right and wrong. It's about what you can prove. That's it. And, and, and even today, like I, when I go back and I look at the record, some of the stuff in the, where, the, where where the mandamus team is going to be at is not is no longer available to the public. Interesting. So, okay. This, it, yeah, that's what I'm going to leave it at that. All right. <laughs> Now, don't be nervous, bro. I mean, it's, o- it's okay to be nervous. When you get in there and start talking, that nervousness will go away. That That's all. Nervousness only exists before you start talking. When you start talking, that nervousness go away. So just be ready for your hearing. All right. I, all right. I got to take another call. I got to take another call, but I appreciate it, brother, okay? All right. Peace and love. All right. Let me go to Eric Code 414. That was a very good call. I like that. It was a good call. It was a good call. I'm going to go up to Wisconsin. I don't think I've talked to anybody in Wisconsin. Wisconsin, 414-0048. You're on the line. What's on your mind? 414, area code. Hit your mute button. What's going on with you? Hey, what's going on, bro? How you doing? Taking it easy. All the things you just about I'm going through them right now. I'm in Florida and I've been in property for seven years and they selling the properties, raising the prices and like you say it's kind of the same situation trying to find a place to stay so that I can focus but at the same time with all the you can't keep a clear head. You know what I'm saying? That's the, but see, that's the challenge, bro. You know, that's the, you're tested, you know, that you can't succumb to negativity. Trust me, man, if you could train your mind to stay positive, I guarantee you're going to get a positive outcome. Guarantee it. Everything you say I know is true. I've experienced it, but it's the backslide. It's like when y'all say, go on, man, go back. Yep. It's like a fight. I'm trying to stay away. I get it. I wanted to figure out how to get a consultation from you because we've been dealing with this thing. I've been trying to a time ago, but it's like, yeah, I'm learning and trying to feel people out and understand. You the realest. That's all I can say because I, I listen to you. I got black laws, dictionaries, and all types of stuff. I'm not, you know, what I'm saying on point, but I'm understanding what you're saying and I'm seeing what they stand by me reading it. But it's like I'm like you. I come from Chicago. I'm in Wisconsin, but I moved to Florida. So it's like I come from an environment that is beat up, run down, and the information is not going to elevate your conscious or your mind or your way of thinking to go to the next level of greatness. All it's going to do is hinder you. Uh, all the negative stuff that comes with it. You feel me? So I right. came to Florida and I bumped in. I bumped into y'all. Got the, I'm like, the conscious mind, the mores. I, I corrected some of my status. That was more of my concern. But at the same time, I get what you're saying too. Get rid of that security number and quit playing with these people. Because yeah. you basically just bonding yourself to contract and see I'm learning it, and I've heard, I've heard y'all say this repeatedly, but I've applied certain things and kind of spooked about other things because after child support, I ain't going to lie to you. They couldn't pay me to sign the document. <laughs> 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 I'm, I'm keeping real with you, bro. I'm 
I'm not a child support with my kids, mama, my son, daughter, it's all grown. It's like I'm spooked about certain stuff. So it's like, I'm not signing that. <laughs> I went to a stage with the judge, and when you speak, when you speak of stuff, you spook the judge. I was in the courtroom one time, and I walked in there, and she was trying to get me for child support. And you know, being in jail, listening to the old jailhouse lawyers, they tell you certain little things not to do when you get in there, but you really don't understand what you're doing because you ain't experienced it. Right. Say you're going off another person's fault. Hey, I get all that. So I exercised something on the uh the the the, the uh child support attorney or a judge or whoever they was administrator, whatever you want to call it. They told me to sign this document to say in so many words that I would uh basically get employed and pay the child support. And I was one with her so much to a point I'm like. You're not in the bed with us, so what makes you get the right to justify what's going on with our situation? They don't. They don't until you get that. They, they get that contract on you. They will. <laughs> That's the contract they try to get you to sign. Look how I did them. This is how I knew they gonna say the stuff you did. The Most High was with me because I did all this shit by default. So the judge was like, "Sign this paper." So he went up there and I signed John Doe on the paper, right? So you come red as a well. <laughs> you, you red, don't have the money I'll take your license so over a period of time of listening to y'all it all made sense from past history of experiencing the stuff but not having the knowledge and know of what was transpiring within the system with you and the entity the being the name but it's all making sense now because I've lived long enough I'm 47 going to be 48 I've basically been listening to y'all for like the last Six years, you, I fear, ties, all of them, and it's like I stick with you because I'm more to the money. What it's like, you, you, you can't run it this way unless you're going from the religious perspective. And like you say, you gotta have morals, you gotta have integrity, and you gotta stand for something. And if you're not willing to do those type of things, stick to commerce and get your money and play the game in the monopoly board how it's played. But understand, like what you say, to protect your assets. That's right. And those are the things that I see. Those are the things that I'm seeing that they're doing. I'm like, well, I get the insurance for the car. I didn't do it, you know what I'm saying, because I knew the situation. I didn't want to argue and box with these people and figure the formula out. But I understood when I signed the contract for the insurance that it's a $1,000 deductible, there's a $10,000 bond. So basically I beat myself out because I could have paid for the bond and competency enough to know how to extinguish the matters of what y'all be saying. But at the same time, because we're debtors, we allow someone to represent us, and they go and take care of the bond, and you paying them whatever the bond is here is not what you're paying them monthly for the year. At the end of the year, if you've not defaulted, we can't even ask for a rollover. We start a new process. It's like theft by deception. <laughs> yeah. Well, brother, you said you... you 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 said the consultation. No, nah, so you it's cool, man. It's cool. You were talking about the consultation. I'm listening to you. Um, I kind of held off on consultations because I I've, I've been so busy. I wasn't able to get to them like I want to. So I had to kind of put them on hold for just about a week or two. Um, but what I'm going to do when I start back consultations, I'm only going to be accepting payment for consultations through Currency Circulator. The reason I'm using Currency Circulator, y'all, is because I want to give back to all of you. You know, I don't want you to think, think that I'm some greedy person and things like that. I mean, I, I really had this dream where I wanted us, all these, these financial conditions that we're going through, I think they can be addressed. You know, I don't understand why we have to have mortgages and car notes and all of these things. What we need is to use unify and everybody pay off all of that shit. And I see, I see the vision, how it can be done. I see how it can be done. Um, there's a verse in the Bible that money, money solveth everything. I think it was um, Solomon who said it. He said, you know, money, you know, if you, you, most of your problems could be solved in life if you had enough money. A lot of. I, 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 I believe that to a degree, but I've learned over a time, I've had money, I've learned those old statements, a fool and his money shall depart. And it's like where we at at this stage of the game with the knowledge that you bumping us with, if people don't really get on board, like you said, they, you're going to be sucked through a vacuum. Because the reality is they have no concern for us whatsoever. The only concern they have is reciprocally uh, sucking in debtors. Basically, you can't yep. liability. Because I'm understanding, I'm reading these things in the trust, and it's like, 
you telling me he has the title, possession, nine tenths of the law, and then you talking about equitability? I possess the thing, but I owe you. Like where the hell they do that? At? <laughs> right. I'm, I'm telling you, I'm listening to you, bro. I'm from the concrete, but it's it's like if I could just grab the knowledge that you have and put it in the proper perspective because I am. It takes time. Me. Listen, man, just study the study the words. Um, I'm always talking about words. Words are the key to understanding. So. You know, once you start, it's a language you're, you're learning. All you, just equate this with going to China and learning Chinese, man. It's the same type of principle. You know, when you first go into China, man, you, you know, everybody thinking Chinese, you sound confused. But at the, I mean, I, I'll give you a better scenario. I remember one time uh, my friend, uh, his, uh, his, uh, his grandfather was from Jamaica. I mean, he was from like the backwoods of Jamaica. He was like heavy Jamaican. What got the out in a bar? You know, I didn't, I did not understand nothing that this nigga was saying. You know what I'm saying? Right. Nothing he was saying. I stayed with him for two weeks, man. I was, I was his translator. Everybody said, what'd he say? Oh, he said he'd go in there and sit down and <laughs> I was trying, you know what I'm saying? So you, you be around it long enough. I was, after I stayed with him for about two, three weeks, I understood every word he was saying. I, we got to hold a conversation with him. It, it, it was amazing how my, my interpretation, my mind of hearing what I heard just became something totally different. I, he just talked to me and he walked around the apartment with a chicken foot in his mouth and talking because he did a lot of, um, uh, he had a lot of customers because he was into a lot of, he, we call him a science man and stuff like that. But um, he was, uh, you, know, he, he, you know, it's amazing how when you start, if you acclimate yourself to something and immerse yourself into something, something long enough how it, repetition is the key to everything you cannot get around repetition that's why a lot of times y'all hear me come on i'm repeating things the same thing like this nigga keeps saying i'm the holder of new course here's the third part i keep saying that shit over and over and over again because i want y'all to memorize it i want you every show you know i want y'all to hear me say that shit you know what i'm saying so what you mean by it's a mantra you gotta be it's like what you say we watch the brain i'm gonna give you one good analogy we know tupac shit I want to know the law like how I know when the fuck Tupac come on. Yeah. Yeah. That's the way. I'm like, I'm with you. I'm with you. Because I don't put too much shit with this. It's like, this is the this is where the, the road comes right now because I'm looking at how they just whacked homeboy for, uh, what was that? The uh, Cash App dude. Then they want to implement Fed now. We can't do this. We can't do that. Anything that's against something that'll lift us and uh, uh, awaken us, it's against your process and your program, or like you say, stallion, the Marxism and all. I trust you, I hear you. I done read some of this shit. It's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> really bizarre. People don't understand if they really read these things, they'll be like, you would, it's like dude said with Roddy Piper when he had the V in the movie back in the days when he put the glasses on and he could see the lizards and shit. I get what Dick Gregory saying now once you put the glasses on, you can't take them off. You can't take them off. And that's why you can't, you, you can't take them off. And that, if anybody, that's why that's why this movement grows is because people go in them courtrooms. It don't matter what nobody say. Oh, that's some bullshit and everything. But when people go in them courtrooms and the first time they talk for themselves or they experience what I'm talking about for themselves, you can't never take that away. It's all, no, they, they are doing something. You know, you're just like, no, nah, no, nah, fuck what you're talking about, bro. I got, I got the glass. I saw what I saw and shit, you know. And it's like, uh, uh, you, you can't never take that away. And that's just like with me. It's like once your eyes are opened, once your eyes are open, they can't never go back to. Like That's like if you ever experienced money. Once you experience what it's like to have a million dollars, you don't ever want to go back to being broke. You'll never accept that again. Once your mind, you can't make a, a, man, a mind that's been expanded to, to, to contract back. Once it's been expanded. That's why when you that's why when you said the journey that you went through when everybody was throwing you under the bus and shit, I know the feeling I didn't do that. Yeah. <laughs> that's why I said I came I I come to Florida and I figured out a mechanism that works and I see how you can evolve and it's not a problem. Coming from Chicago to Florida, I'm gonna show people something. I want people to listen. When they tell y'all don't come to Florida, all the hurricanes, that's to keep these stupid ass niggas from down here from overpopulating Florida because they got enough niggas to handle and paint. But I'll tell you this much about Florida. I went on a beach one time, and I'm from Chicago. I went on a beach just like some beach that they got a toll booth or something. It's not South Beach. It's another beach that you got to go to by the zoo. And I've never seen this shit in my life. I've been in a, 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 a plethora of multiplex cultures, and I've been in the ghettos with niggas and black folk, white folk. But when I hit this beach, 
I have never in my life seen as many dark-skinned people on the beach. It looked like you were in Africa or Haiti somewhere, and this what threw me off. I've seen a couple white people in the circle, and I'm from Chicago. I'm like, y'all ain't scared? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm a real light skin fair nigga, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm like, y'all ain't I'm, I'm talking about like going to like going to the biggest amusement park in the world and not seeing a white face nowhere. And if you did, it's like, how did you come out of the shot? And this is in Florida? They, they have beat your ass or lit. And it's like, it, it, it's not a racist thing, but where I come from, that like, you're some of the more they, it's colonization concept. Then when you get to Florida, you see the diversity where the Cubans is light, dark, black. You would right. think, oh, well, White. Like y'all can man, y'all don't understand. And that's how I start understanding international law, international trade. And with listening to you, I start coming up with some bright ideas, but it's like you gotta get past the gatekeepers first with those that's knowledgeable can apply the method or you have to work hard and learn what you're learning. And I can comprehend that as well. But a lot of people when they open that internet up, that's why they wanna shut it down because now I understand at first I never understood what the market was. It was always the negative in the, uh, information from the internet that kind of kept me away from investing. I was calculating something, and we we just not understand what they trying to do. You you got a plethora. All you have to do is build yourself, build your brand, and get an ally that you can exchange foreign with. However, the process works because I was in Florida living with the Jamaicans. The Jamaicans were sitting up getting cars from the auction, and they was going way down to the port of Miami dropping them right off at the port, sending them overseas. They couldn't send nothing over there less than three or four years old. They were sending cars pieces. The hood was still off. The doors were still off. Put it on when you get it over there. <laughs> Getting good money. I want that same type of action. I'm tired of being pigeonholed. Everything you say is the same thing most of us out here feeling, for real. And we know it. We just need to, like you say, chime in, open our brains up, and, 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 and try to focus. But I tell you this, and I know it's the truth when you say it. These towers they putting up, I didn't experience them rings and shit and hear people be talking about it. Now, the only time you get the rings is the high altitudes of your ass you want. I be calculating and contemplating too, bro. So it's like, it just be all kind of weird stuff that be going on. And it's like, we got a hell of a fight. Like you say, this is Prince Pally. This is the <laughs> It is, but the key, bro. Let me tell you, man. And I, I've done. I've been doing this. You know. You know. I'm 55 years old, and um, I've been doing this right. for about 17 years. And I can tell you, man, it comes down to, and I've, I've done a lot of studies and a lot of different cultures, and it basically, it comes down, if you want things to change, you have to, you, you cannot focus on the negative. You got to focus on what you want, not on what you don't want. That is the major, that's the thing, that's just the thing, that's it. If you want to be wealthy, you cannot be thinking poverty thoughts, you know? Like, I have to watch myself, like, sometimes I get cheap, and say, oh, I don't want to pay that much for this, or I don't, you know, I'm going to go the cheap route, and I have to remind, no, don't go the cheap route. Money is relative you know what is cheap something cheap that's a relative term you know a million dollars is cheap to a billionaire a million dollars is cheap to a billionaire you know what i'm saying what is it's relative you know something that costs you a hundred thousand dollars car is cheap to a, a multi-millionaire or something like that why it's expensive to you something expensive or 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 or, or cheap is something that's relative to your position so you got to train your mind to think in a certain way that's on a higher level by exposing yourself to only higher level things to only immersing yourself into only higher level things and that it begins with only a Immersing yourself in the positive, all right? That's all positive. You can't give it, don't, no negative self-talk. You should never talk about yourself negatively. That's what a lot of people have with Donald Trump. Donald Trump, one, it's, this is really the underlying reason why a lot of people, like they don't like it because they think he's arrogant because this nigga, he believed in himself so much. Nobody believed that he would really become president. They didn't believe, I, I remember when he first started talking, I said, man, Donald Trump ain't gonna be president. This nigga won. And now he got everybody loving him on the landslide and everything. And if you hear him talk, it sounds so arrogant, but he's practicing. He's an elitist. He, he understands it. You don't never doubt yourself or say nothing negative about yourself. And y'all feel it with him. Whether you like him or not. That's what he's doing. No, listen, I didn't vote for the uh, carrot top. I listened to a lot of stuff he said, and I paid very well, and I listened to you as well as how we was following on the Q&I and all that. I peeped the game. I understand what's going on. And 
And at the same time, like you said, what you said with the taxes. If you read the documents, just like I was listening and following y'all, the IRS manual shows you that you don't have to pay taxes if you go about the process. Like you say, it's not avoiding the taxes. I mean, paying the taxes is just avoiding. Yep. If you if you arrange your affairs in a certain way, you know, as or, or conduct your affairs in a certain way, everything is about systems and processes and learning uh, the correct way to do things. And uh, it's just like a dude. Uh, he told me this. <laughs> he, I said, what's the difference between rich people and poor people? He said, rich people know how to fill out forms. And he's absolutely correct. You know, you got to just know the proper procedures to follow. When you follow the proper procedures, life becomes easy. You know, it's ignorance is the problem. It's ignorance. It's ignorant. But you said the key, and that's why I don't like it, but I swallow it and eat it up and move forward. The key, what you said is, y'all people sit around here and say that we useless, we goyim, and we all live. But you allow the system to be did in so many. Well, I, I still find that double-edged sword. You still implemented uh, the wrong information in the school. What results did you expect to turn out of this? Exactly. And you want to tell me I'm a bad guy? Exactly. I'm a bad guy? Then we just then we defy that monkey ball shit that y'all put on the table. All the crack era, you got crackheads that's the elevated and made millions. I've seen this shit in the streets. Like, how you was just smoking crack last week and you ride benzes and chats this way? Where they do that shit at? What you know, it is, man, what it is, man, is just really fear. They talking shit. Oh, y'all, y'all not, y'all inferior. That's, but it's really fear. Because if we, if we were inferior, if inferior, we didn't have to pay us no attention. But you got to be we're going all out, flooding us with drugs, you know, giving us wrong information, you know, just doing that. You're going all out and then turn around. Y'all inferior people, man, get out of here with that. You know, get out. This is what throw me off. Y'all have done so much crazy bullshit. And we still ain't beat your ass for it. We get our side. We ain't got to worry. Just like you said, you want to really see who the strength and the peoples are? I'm not here to compare with an albino or albion, Michael Dice. None of those things because I got a sister that's light skin. She just went and did some things with a Mexican. Now I got a little, cu- I mean, a niece that's called Bella that look like European. So now she gets to play both fields. The question is, she's going to know where she come from, but then she's going to understand she gets to sit on the other side to see why they don't like us. So we're going to play both fields. All my question would be to my peoples and them, why do y'all keep mixing with each other when you know that you have a conflict with each other? You two love each other, but the whole bloodline defies everybody. That's like keeping conflict in the air. You like striking matches or starting sparks. I don't have a problem with interracial relationships. My thing is, when people get involved with people, they don't check the backgrounds to see who these people's families are, no matter how much they love them. You can be off on your own, but this is based on not individual. I-N-N-D-I-D-I-D-D-I-U-A-L. You all. We're going to cast some spells. Until we can figure out how each other's background and cultures is, we are not going to be successful in mixing with the people that concept and history has been shown to suppress, manipulate, deny the fact that you don't have proof of any slave ships, and if you did, you wouldn't take accountability because it put their head on a chopping block. That's why I don't believe that mess. Because from my understanding, in admiralty and maritime law, I'm in Miami. You got to pull up to the dock, and there's got to be documents. So where is the documents for you kidnapping the niggas? Because you had to have information for them to get on the boat. Well, you know what? What it is is 80 to 90 percent of slaves went to South America. They didn't even come to America. And we the minority. Majority of white people in America did not have slaves. They didn't have slaves. And a lot of Europeans were slaves. Slavery was real now. Uh, If you go to South Carolina, they have an exhibit where they show a lot of this stuff. They have evidence of a lot of different things. Uh, But, but. you know what I'm saying? They're not telling us the full truth, but they're not. A lot of the first home, a lot of the first slave owners were black too. Anthony Johnson, y'all can look him up. Pull up Anthony Johnson, first slave owner. He's the he's the person who went to court 
and got uh, and and he's the first person who got perpetual slavery going was a black man. People don't know this. It was not a white person. A lot of white person were abolitionists and uh, uh, wanted to end slavery. What the, the the key is, what people don't understand is the real people who were behind slave uh, the slave trade were Jews. All right, that's what the, that's what that's what that's the information that's being hidden from every from everyone. Y'all can go read Dantel's Jackson's. We thought they were white. Go read Dantel's Jackson. We thought they were white. Dantel Jackson. Dantel Jackson. Dantel Jackson. We thought they were white. Yeah, is that, yeah, we, we thought they were white. Yeah, just yeah. His, his name is Dante no. Jackson. Yeah, read that. That's a brother. When I read the black bullshit, I started reading that to Karl Marx and shit. I'm like, this shit, y'all don't really. This, they got us upside down. That's why, and it's a shame because how do you classify people when you say you use the social? Then you have to be uh, psych, uh what is that constitutional uh, psychological psychological evaluation at the same token. Uh, the same token, you are scientists that use me as the experiment. It wouldn't be no different than the Tuskegee experiment. It would, but you gotta understand, man. That 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 racism and white stuff—they they above that. They did that shit to everybody, man. It we are in uh we in a we're in an age now where it is about um your stat uh your status. This is classism that uh, we are involved in right now, and people got to understand that they're using the racism thing to kind of separate us. You need to have pride of your own of your own race. Don't get me wrong, but you got to You got that's why I'm talking about this because. You know, if you root your mind in that, there are no victims. There are no victims. No one is responsible for your situation. Nobody's holding you back from achieving what you need to achieve in life or anything like that. The only person that is in your way is you. (laughs) <laughs> that's the only person that is in your way right. and you got the power over all things and that's why I'm sitting there telling you if you root your mind and positivity there ain't nobody stopped me from accomplishing nothing in life that I want I done been married divorced in prison I made a lot of money I've been poor I've been homeless I didn't I didn't I, it seems like I've been taken through all the different things that you can happen in life so I can sit here and, and now and I swore I would never be a teacher and I'm sitting here teaching every damn night teaching something. I said I wasn't going to be a teacher, you know. So it's just, it's the things that, you know, where life is going to take you. But I tell you, just make your declaration, understand the power of the tongue, and things will go positive to you. Hey, brother, I got to go to the next call because my time is running low. I got about 12 more minutes. I got to take this last call, okay? All right, I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Peace to the gods, and I will get back to you. I want to be a part of that Okay, bro. Okay. All right. I got to go to the next call. 314 Missouri. I wanted to get you Missouri. I got about 12 minutes left. I, uh, you know, because I, I was supposed to get you first when I got your last, you call back in, raised your hand. Missouri, 314-4917. What's happening, bro? How you doing, brother? I'm doing good, man. What's happening? I, I called you. All right. Uh, I called you before. Uh, it was about a few weeks ago. And, uh, you know, basically I, I can't stress enough how much you appreciate it. Uh, I was the brother that told you I was Dick Gregory's personal consultant. Yes, I remember that. <laughs> I remember and, that. And Let, me Let me write I down your number. Let me write down your number because I did, because you got the um, the health type thing, right? Yeah, I have a very large dispensary and uh, I, I basically have been in a circle of intrigue of German physicians. That's why Dick had always classified me is one of the greatest minds. I have some of the most successful in-stage cancer case studies, so I don't make any claim to cure anything. Okay? Uh, I think that's a, that's a bad idea. Mm-hmm. You know, the body has the ability to heal itself. Right. But I want to certainly share with you a science uh, offline if you can give me a call when time permits. I'll call, I'll call you today. I believe you I'll call you today. I'll call you today. Let me get let me give you the set my cell, which is three one four. Well, I got your number right here. I'm uh, looking at it. You don't have to. You don't have to. Uh, oh, oh, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. If you want to put it out over the public, because <laughs> you know people are listening, uh, right? Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I got your number. I got I got the number that you called in on. I have that. Can I use that number? Uh, yeah, that's the landline. That's absolutely. Okay, I'll call but, you on that. I, I wanted to. 
No, go ahead. And I, I just want to put the emphasis on the appreciation of you putting such an emphasis on the maxims of law. That has helped me out, I mean, so much over the years. But I've been listening to you for about six, seven years. Okay. okay? And it has helped me out tremendously. You know, when, you, when you're when using that one contract, you put an emphasis on the uh, consent makes the law. And mm-hmm. I don't think a lot of people realize that. That, you know, like in the maximum law, the agreement of the parties makes the law of the contract. And so even in my in my health practice, I use that very successfully, saying as much out of minimum contact, you know, without making claims. <laughs> didn't, it help you, like didn't it help you be a bit better businessman? I know it did me. It just helped me be better at business and all kind of things, you know, just understanding the maxims of law, you know, helped me tremendously, too. It did. And, and and just the shorts that you put out on the YouTube, on the shorts, is so helpful. I share that with a lot of people. And, and, and like, see, you know, I'm, I'm a part of the SBC University, so I'm encouraging other people to take that and almost instead of going to college, you know. <laughs> and uh, because they're going to learn a lot more. I appreciate know? it. But, uh, but the thing is, and, and, and like you put an emphasis on, if you want to get out of the system, stop using their shit, as you stated before. And just turn off that faucet for accepting benefits and privileges and become independent. You know, I've owned three health food stores. I had never had a business loan because of the red tape in Missouri. So I just put the, you know, basically masterminded how to get enough funds to finance the health food store at the time. Right. Because there's a lot of red tape. And, mm-hmm. and the emphasis you were putting on what you've been through is all about perseverance and believing in yourself. Yes. You know, and like you stated about Donald Trump, you have to believe in yourself, no matter how many times you get knocked down. That's right. If you know that you have the talent and you develop the will to persevere, you're going to persevere. And and I don't even do a lot of advertising. Word of mouth, I have 80% of my clientele is outside of Missouri, from California to New York. Like I said, I've had Hugh Hefner, I've had James Ingram, because of Dick Gregory, uh, basically endorsing because okay. um, I'm probably considered one of the most uh, diversified health practitioners. Do you want to put your, uh, let me give you a plug. You want to put your information out so people can contact you and, t- and say what you do. I'll give you a plug right now. Go ahead and, you know, tell what your services are, what you do. Go uh, ahead. They, they can go to www.d is in dinosaur, O-C-B-O-T-A-N-I-C-A, Doc Botanica, D-O-C-B-O-T-A-N-I-C-A, Dot com. That's my website, and you'll see a lot of, a lot of the things that I offer. Uh, I'm matter of fact, I'm the only melanated professional in this region that does what they call bioidentical hormone testing. Can you give me that and website again? One of the leading laboratories in the- Can you repeat that website uh, one more time? Uh, 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 www.docbotanica, D-O-C, B-O-T-A-N-I, D-O-C, D as in dog, O C B is in baseball O T A N I C A Doc Botanica dot com, and you can see the uh, also my Facebook, which is Doc Botanica. Okay, gotcha, well. Doc Botanica. But, uh, okay, I've been doing this since I was, yeah, I've been actually studying since I was nine, and I have been in a very interesting circle of intrigue. So you know, I you know, like I say, women. I just published a book, matter of fact, two years ago, called Stealing a Woman's Treasure. And it'll be republished along with a book I published under my surname at the time called Medicine, M-E-D-I-S-I-N. Okay. Cause and Solutions to this. And that book was endorsed by Dick Gregory. Okay. And so I'll be re-entering that book on the market. Yeah, I see all your products right here. Yeah, okay. Stratagus, eight more. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. will talk. We will talk. Spring Dragon Longevity Drops, C-1000 Plus, Vitamin C. Okay, yeah. You got a lot of herbs. Okay. Okay, I see you. Uh, and, and and the last, I, I'm a, like I said, I'm the only uh, Asiatic melanated in the entire region that's a provider for ZRT Labs. They're one of the top laboratories in nanotechnology that does bioidentical hormone testing, neurotransmitter testing, cardiometabolic profiling. Uh, and like I said before, we need to keep you around for a long time. Okay. <laughs> and, and like uh, we have to elevate our health. And one of the things that separates me from a lot of practitioners is I also have great product knowledge. So I'm not going to give you no bullshit. 
I'm know, looking at you. I mean, I've never even heard of ZRT Labs. I'm on their website now, and I'm like, wow, this is very interesting. Wow. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. And, and so, again, I mean, I have an impeccable track record. Like, the ticket turned me on to Hugh Hefner and James Ingram and his family. And I've had Eddie Robinson as a client of mine when he was living. And, uh, and, and what I do is literally, my company used to be all health concerns because I literally address all health concerns because of my background in traditional Chinese medicine, orthomolecular medicine. Uh, if you ever heard of the Gerson therapy, which is a phenomenal, been around since the 30s, I was trained under the Gerson therapy as well. Okay. But again, I don't claim to cure anything. I basically provide a bona fide protocol to enhance the quality of life. You okay. know, I think it's someone to say, hey, I cure this and I cure that. No, the body cures itself. Self. You I, just have to find the right modalities and the right protocol. And that's why every individual, it needs to be an indiv- individualized protocol because everybody's not the same. All right, we're gonna you know, but, we're gonna uh, talk, and I, I, this testing looks interesting too. We're gonna talk, I'm gonna call you today, bro. I'll call you today. I'm gonna hey, call you. Hey, today. I look forward to it, bro. We're gonna it, talk. It is it, it's an honor, and you are a living legend. I appreciate it, <laughs> and I just have to put that out, and I, I, I'm sure everybody out there agrees as well. I appreciate it. I appreciate it, bro. I'm humbled. Thank you so much. I appreciate you, bro. We'll call. Okay. I, I won't hold you any longer. All right, brother. All Thank right, you. Peace and love. Peace and love. All right, y'all. Look, that's it. I only had about three more minutes left. Um, I want to reiterate again, Dallas, Texas. Link is under the description. It's going to register you in Currency Circulator. Don't get confused by that. Um, I am just I have all your name, all your information, everything in there, all your documents you're going to need. Everything is going to be in Currency Circulator. This is what I'm starting to do with all my seminars. I'm putting everybody in the circulator because we're going to do this trust, y'all. And I'm going to put it together. I'm going to pull the trigger on this thing. I want to thank CC for the $51. CC for the $50. Bobby Bond. But y'all going in with the $50. Thank you for that. For the $10. I appreciate that. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Let me go back up here and also thank Mike Sinatra. Okay, I already got you. Okay, I got Mike Sinatra. I got uh, Asarel Shimson Yisrael for the five. I appreciate that, brother. Appreciate that. Appreciate appreciate all the donations. I appreciate all my listeners. I appreciate all the support that all of you have been giving me over the years. I will be back on tomorrow. I want y'all to go out and enjoy your Memorial Day and be safe out there. And as usual, peace to all the gods and goddesses. And I will see y'all tomorrow. All right. Peace, y'all. I'm out. Peace.